Good evening. Welcome to the special meeting for the BET application for Tuesday, December 18th, 2018. And may we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Meyer, here. 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 Would everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. At this time, I'd like to open the public hearing on and with consideration for adoption of certain ordinances and amendments. And at this time, I'd like to call on our township solicitor, Michael Clark. Thank you, President Luker. We're here tonight for a hearing um, on uh, text amendment and a zoning map amendment uh, for a BET uh, for a property uh, located at, give me the property again. Where are the address? Excuse me, are located at 1059, 1067, and 1073 Old York Road, and 1062 Huntington Road. Uh, this hearing has been uh, duly advertised. Uh, there are two proposed ordinance before the board tonight. Uh, an ordinance of Abington Township, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, amending the Abington Township Zoning Ordinance of 2017 as amended by amending Article 7 AO Apartment off Office District adding H-12 senior apartment units as a use permitted by conditional use in the AO apartment office district by amending Article 21 use regulations, adding H-12 senior apartment units as a use and by amending Article 13, uh, 23, excuse me, parking and transportation to include use H-12 senior apartments and an ordinance of Abington Township, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, enacted pursuant to the First Class Township Code and the Pennsylvania Municipalities Code and the official zoning map of Abington Township to rezone a certain tract of real property from CS Community Service District and R3 Medium Density Residential District <coughs> to AO Apartment Office District. The applicant this evening is represented uh, by Robert Gunlock Esquire, uh, Mr. Gunlock, are you ready to proceed? Yes. And please proceed. Uh, thank you. Um, just by way of a few housekeeping items, um, we did uh, submit a letter to Attorney Clark uh, on December 17, enclosing consents from the three property owners um, that own the four parcels that have been described um, by uh, Mr. Clark. Um, these letters confirm um, their consent uh, to uh, this hearing proceeding and their properties uh, being rezoned as proposed. We previously have provided agreements of sale. <laughs> I believe the agreements of sale together with these letters confirm our standing. I'd just like to mark that letter and the attachments um, as uh, exhibit uh, A1. Uh, second, uh, we did uh, send a binder of documentation over uh, to the township under cover letter dated December 14th. Um, that binder uh, has the letter to um, Township Manager Manfredi uh, with uh, seven documents, um, excuse me, eight uh, documents, I believe, uh, for this uh, hearing. Um, the letter, uh, I like to mark that binder, as, if I can, as uh, A2, uh, and then the documentation in it as A2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Um, We've distributed extra copies of that binder to everybody, um, and uh, believe one may have been posted on the township uh, webpage, uh, but it contains um, documentation that has uh, previously been, been reviewed and, and submitted, uh, but we wanted to put it all in one place uh, for the hearing. Uh, with that uh, background, Mr. Chairman, what we'd like to do 
is uh, start with um, a brief uh, presentation um, from um, um, our client here, um, Mr. Markman, uh, summarizing uh, the overview of the project, which essentially is the A22 uh, materials uh, in your binder um, to give everybody uh, an overview as to the uh, type of um, development he has proposed if um, the rezoning and text amendment uh, are adopted uh, by this commission. Um, he's also going to review some of the fiscal impacts associated with the project if it's adopted. Um, from there, we're going to call uh, more of our technical witnesses uh, with Mr. Kennedy, who is our land planner, who will walk um, the members uh, through the proposed text amendment and give a summary of that. Uh, as well as recent revisions to that document uh, after discussions with the County Planning Commission. Um, and he will also then talk uh, about the uh, proposed rezoning to the AO. Uh, we then will briefly uh, call our traffic engineer, uh, Chris Williams, to give an overview of the traffic impact assessment report that's included within the materials as well. Uh, we'll be as efficient as we can in running uh, through um, this uh, testimony. If you would, please, and I'd ask the commissioners to hold off their questions, and that would probably work better for you also if you make your entire presentation and then we ask questions. Sure, and everyone okay. will be here then to ask the appropriate question. Good, thank okay. you. Move on. Good. Uh, so let me call uh, Mr. Markman. Uh, if I can just swear in all of our witnesses while they're here. <coughs> okay. 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 You want to sit here? Um, I'll just go through with the... Okay, good. Just so, Mr. Markman, um, you are a um, principal and officer of the applicant here, BET Investments, Inc., correct? Yes. Okay. And you're involved um, with this uh, project on behalf of the applicant? Yes. And uh, you are familiar with the subject property and the ordinances that are being uh, proposed here this evening? Yes, sir. And you've prepared materials that we've marked as A22. Uh, which is going to give the board a summary of the uh, development that you uh, would propose to construct if these ordinances were adopted, correct? Yes. Okay, let's run through that, please. Great, thank you. So going, I guess, which we've already talked about, um, let's just see if I can get in the microphone. So basically the proposed zoning is a pros map change of existing parcels from CS and R3 to AO apartment office district, and then a text amendment to allow for increased density for senior apartment units that allow apartments to be occupied for people of 55 and older. Um, they're currently being used as conforming and non-conforming uses, which include the YMCA gym, child care, funeral home, and, and an existing house. Um, if the zoning is changed, we intend to develop the parcel for luxury one and two bedroom senior apartments. Uh, amenities include upscale gathering areas, resort style pool, and fitness center. Average monthly rents will be in excess of $2,000. Um, just in the trade area of Abington is an aging population. So within three miles um, of this location, there's 10,600 people 55 and older that earn $75,000 or more. Within five miles of 30,000 people. It's an aging population and, and we're trying to accommodate people that live in Abington to stay in Abington. This is just a map that shows the location um, what we're looking for is the AO zoning. The AO zoning, which John Kennedy will get into in more depth, is actually represented in the dark brown on the zoning map, which is right across street, Sunrise, obviously, Rydell Park, and some other locations. This shows a dashed line where the location is. It's the existing YMCA, the existing funeral home, and one house behind. This shows the location, which is right off of Old York Road and Susquehanna Road. This, this shows basically a footprint of the building that, that could be constructed. Um, through feedback, we actually um, separated the building into two separate buildings um, with underground parking. Um, so it's, it's basically people can park outside the elements for the most part um, with roof decks, roof terraces that'll be landscaped um, and apartment units, pools. So if you look in the right-hand corner and we kind of summarized it. The density, um, minimum density is 24 units the acre, but the ability to, with bonus provisions to go to 36 units the acre, building coverage 50%, impervious 65, green area 35%, maximum height is 50 feet, but only 40 feet within 100 feet of a boundary of a residential neighborhood. 
And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this over to my architect, Matt Johnson, to start going through some of the dimensional requirements and, and the architecture for the property. Hi, I'm Matt Johnson with BET, and I'll walk you through the design of the project. Um, so here you can see the setbacks. Um, we're using a 45-foot setback um, from residential properties. You can see that like to the rear of our property and also on the, the east uh, boundary. Um, it was recommended to us by the uh, Environmental Advisory Committee to use a 50-foot setback against residential properties. Um, you'll see that our building doesn't really come close to this 45-foot setback line in many areas except for right here. Um, so using that 50-foot setback uh, would be something we would be willing to do. Um, and it'd be a, a pretty easy change for us to make. Um, our setback along Old York Road is, uh, we're, we're building to the build to line as recommended by the Montgomery County Planning Commission. Um, the uh, build to zone is an aspect of current Abington uh, Township zoning. Um, it's part of the MS and BC districts. It's an area 15 to 25 feet away from the curb line along o Old York Road. Um, Montgomery County Planning Commission recommend that we build our building to within 25 feet, or 15 to 25 feet of uh, the build to line on Old York Road. Um, so that's what we're doing. That's what this red line here represents. And then along Susquehanna, we're doing, uh, we have a 25 foot setback from the right of way. Again, there's an additional five foot sidewalk, so we're about 30 feet um, off the street here. <clears throat> building height, um, in the upper right hand corner, you see our site plan again. We have a three story building along Old York, or on Old York Road, and we have a four story building on Susquehanna. Um, this is a section through the four story uh, portion of the building on Susquehanna. Um, the, the portion that's uh, truly four stories would be about 47 feet tall. Um, part of the provision in our, one of the provisions of our text amendment is that um, we could build up, uh, build a maximum building height of 50 feet, um, but in order for it to be 50 feet, it needs to be more than 100 feet away from a residentially zoned property. Um, so you'll notice as we get closer um, to a residentially zoned property, um, we, we lose a story of the building, so our building height would go from 47 feet to about 37 feet on the, on the back side of our building. Uh, along Old York Road, up here, we only have a three-story building, um, which would be about 40 feet tall. Um, compare that to some of the existing properties and existing buildings around our property. Um, the existing YMCA on Old York Road is about 45 feet tall, um, so our building would actually be shorter than the existing YMCA. Um, across, across Susquehanna from, from our property is Sunrise. Um, they're about 45 feet tall. Excuse me one second. Yes. This would probably be the appropriate time to ask everyone to silence their Thank you. cell phones so we don't have to deal with that all night long. Thank you. Thank you, solicitor. So across Susquehanna Road is Sunrise. That building is about 45 feet tall. Again, we're proposing a, a max height of 50 feet, but uh, our design really only gets up to 47 feet, so we're really only a couple feet taller than Sunrise. Uh, look at other buildings close in proximity. Uh, Abington Hospital is about 65 feet, Lionsgate uh, PSU is 55 feet, and Rydal Park is 65 feet. So we have, a, again, we have a max height of 50 feet, and then anything within 100 feet of a residential property would have to be uh, 40 feet or less. One of the concerns raised at previous meetings was that um, our building would be too tall and be too close to some of the neighboring properties and, and would really impact um, what they saw from their backyard, like the amount of sky they would be able to see. Um, so we, we studied that and you can see, um, so this is kind of a view taken from the property directly south uh, of our project. And you can see our proposed view shed. Um, so it's kind of the amount of sky they would see um, before they see the, the building below. So we took that proposed view shed and then uh, took a look at how it was impacted. Um, by, the, by various uses. Um, on the bottom, you see um, the existing YMCA building overlaid in red. Um, and you can see that our proposed view shed is actually an increase over the existing uh, view shed from the Abington YMCA. Um, and then we looked at the other uh, uses that the property is currently zoned for. So um, with the CS zoning, you can build a 45-foot tall building uh, 50 feet from the property line. 
And if you, would, if you were to do that, you would also decrease the view shed. And again, uh, with R3 zoning, you could build a 35 foot tall building uh, 12 feet from, from the property line. And again, you can see here that you would also decrease uh, the view shed if you were to use the existing zoning. So we feel that our zoning, our, our, our setback from the residential properties and, and our building height um, actually increase uh, the, the view corridor and the, like, the amount of sky that our neighbors would be able to see before they saw our building. Um, these are a few images of the existing YMCA that kind of faces the, the neighborhood. Uh, these are some contextual images uh, around the property. We have the church across Old York Road, the old schoolhouse across Susquehanna. This is another building associated with the church and just another commercial building uh, further up York Road. Um, so we looked at the surrounding architecture and kind of decided that we would go with a, uh, a contemporary farmhouse aesthetic. So we, we kind of pulled some elements um, from the contextual architecture, um, the, the building materials, the, the stone masonry looks, um, the pitched roofs, uh, you see the low, the low walls that are prevalent uh, up and down Old York Road. Um, and yeah, so we implemented those into our design. Um, this is the view along Susquehanna. This is the four-story portion of our building. This is the view on Old York Road. So this is the portion of the building that would only be three stories. Um, just for some context, you have the cemetery in the foreground, and this is the medical office building further down Old York Road in the background. Uh, this is the east side of the building um, that's starting to face the neighbors. Um, you can see in some of the previous ones, we had the pitched roofs along the roads. Um, we tried to minimize the pitched roofs on the, on the rear of the building just to uh, decrease the building height as we got closer to the neighbors. And again, this is, this is the rear of the building. You can see um, this, this would be a four-story portion right here. And then you can see once we're within 100 feet of the uh, residentially zoned property, um, we, we would lose the story of the building. So the, the portion of the building back here would only be three stories. We also wanted to take a look at what the building would actually look like from the neighborhood. So we walked along Huntington Road and, and took a few pictures and then had our architect superimpose uh, the, the building into the views. Um, you can see here it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty lush. Uh, you, you see a portion of our building up here. Um, these pictures were taken in the summer, so it's I mean, a lot of leaves on the trees. Um, the Google Earth, when, at the time we did the study, uh, it was the summer, so we went into Google Earth. Uh, they had views from the fall. These pictures were taken in October. Um, you can still see it's pretty lush. You, you still do see a portion of the building up here, um, but, but a lot of it does disappear behind uh, the existing landscaping. Um, just further up Old York Road, or sorry, further up Huntington. Um, Again, a lot of the building kind of goes away. Um, it would be our intention to, to provide a landscape buffer um, in areas where it doesn't exist already on the, the rear property, uh, the rear line of our property. Um, so, so even these areas where you do kind of see through to the building, it would be our intention to, to plant trees in a landscape buffer here so, so you really wouldn't see it from Huntington Road. Um, this is a similar view, and again, um, it would be our intention to plant trees in this area. So. Um, just kind of shield the building from the neighborhood. And then Michael's going to talk about the cemetery. <clears throat> so as we go through this, most of these different comments were people, we, we went through probably 20 hours of meetings, people made comments and we tried to come up with solutions to the comments. Um, the one, one of the uh, situations that came up was the existing cemetery. Um, so in, in light of that, I contacted Gene Huff, who currently takes care of the existing cemetery on behalf of the church. And we tried to come up with a plan to be able to make the cemetery into, um, create a better situation than currently exists there. Um, so what we're willing to do is, is for the cemetery, currently there's, um, you know, it's in a little bit of a state of disrepair. Um, so we, we intend, um, if, if we're approved for this project, to survey the cemetery um, and basically figure out where each grave is um, repair the fence and sidewalk around the cemetery. So basically, for the walkability portions of it, we will, in fact, repair the sidewalk all the way around the cemetery to the extent landscaping needs to be replaced. We would put landscaping there. And then, really, the, the tragedy, and I can tell you I've spent some time there now, and actually my son has been there working in the cemetery to help restore it because I've, I've actually thought about a lot of it and become attached to it. 
Um, creation of a multi-year educational program focused on the history and cultural significance of the cemetery. So our intention would be to survey the graves, try to figure out, Gene tries to figure out who's buried there, and then tie that to the history of Abington and, and work with the high school to kind of create a program to that effect. So in essence, create a multi-year, five-year fund to help restore the history of Abington, the history of the cemetery, and be a responsible neighbor. Um, Going a little bit further, just, just to talk about this type of development, um, and we don't have any of these in Abington, but, but B, at BET we built several of these and there's, there's more being built right now. So apartments today, you're building to basically be resort style living. When you walk into these apartments, you feel you're in a luxury resort. And if you can see, the, they have very, very uh, well appointed in many spaces, group gathering areas, exercise classes, gyms, and really, uh, uh, it turns into a place where people really want to live, and that's our intention here, to create a resort-style environment. Um, we would have a library, restaurant-style, kitchen, great room with fireplace, and lots of gathering areas, card tables, and lots of events that the people can engage in. This just shows a gym and yoga room, which we have in every one of our, our, our properties, a game room where we typically have different games and gathering rooms. Um, another, I, I guess, um, Another concern, obviously, is traffic, and I'm going to let I'm going to let our traffic engineer talk about the actual traffic. But the other one of the other bonus provisions is we're willing to contribute to offsite traffic improvements, um, and and I think initially we have discussed a hundred thousand dollar contribution towards the township's match as part of the bonus provision for the Old York Road Susquehanna road improvements. So we would we would do that as part of the bonus provisions. And then I'm just going to let um, our traffic engineer talk about the next two slides, which show just really the impact of traffic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Williams with McMahon Associates. I just want to talk a little bit about the, the traffic that would be generated by the project. So uh, we've estimated the traffic uh, that will be generated by the proposed use based on data that's um, published nationally for similar type developments. So the first row across this table shows uh, proposed age, proposed age restricted development, 180 units, and this data is based on data that's uh, published by the Institute of Transportation Engineers, and it's based on actual studies of other similar land uses. So this is based on real data. So what the ITE data tells us is that for a development of this size, it would generate 698 trips over the course of a weekday. A uh, total of 36 trips during the weekday morning rush hour, so th uh, 13 entering, 23 exiting, and 45 total trips during the weekday evening commuter rush hour, uh, 25 entering, 20 exiting. Uh, by comparison, we, we we're comparing that to the traffic generated by the site today. So to estimate the traffic generated by the site today, uh, we did two things. We, we took a look at ITE data, but we also conducted counts of the existing facility. So we, we counted the traffic coming in and out of the driveways today. Uh, so what this shows, the second row shows the traffic generated by the YMCA today. Uh, you can see 1,135 trips daily, uh, total, of 200 and, total of 231 trips in the weekday morning peak hour and 224 trips in the weekday evening commuter peak hour. So just by comparison, uh, the difference the proposed age-restricted community generates 437 less trips over the course of a full day, uh, 195 less trips during the weekday morning rush hour, and 179 less trips during the weekday evening commuter peak hour. So th this is a little bit hard to see, but this basically just um, show, presents the same data in a different fashion. So this is a bar graph that presents the traffic generated by the site during the weekday commuter peak hours, the weekday morning rush hour, the weekday evening rush hour. So the blue column, the blue bar shows the traffic generated by the site today based on actual counts. This, these, this is real data. Uh, and then uh, at one point there was a proposal for 225 uh, units. That's in green. Uh, the yellow bar shows the traffic generated by the proposed development with 180 units, which is the proposal, the current proposal. So again, you can just see visually uh, the, the, the relative difference in the traffic generated by the project 
uh, as a YMCA, which is the blue bar, and then as the proposed age-restricted development, which is the yellow bar. So again, it's 195 less trips in the morning rush hour, 179 less trips in the weekday evening rush hour. So uh, from a traffic impact perspective, um, we're actually taking traffic off the road with this development. So the YMCA is, a, is generating a lot of traffic. The new development will generate significantly less traffic. So we're actually taking traffic off the road. So not only is there no impact or is there minimal impact, there's actually, actually a benefit in terms of reduction in traffic on the surrounding road system. So we did an economic impact study um, showing the taxes generated uh, by this property compared to the taxes that it currently generates. So the YMCA is a nonprofit. The YMCA currently does not generate any taxes from the property. So basically when we looked at the numbers and we've submitted the report to you, then the, the, there's obviously no students involved with this development. It's 55 and older, age restricted. We will do not allow students, any student age people to live at the property. Um, the net impact to the schools, the money that this would produce each year <coughs> for the schools would be $565,146. So the, the, the money that the school district would get, and if you wanna look at how they borrow money, that would provide about debt service for something close to $20 million of, of the new high school that they're building. So it, it would have the impact of a $20 million um, grant to that high school. So, so essentially the $565,000 is putting the, the uh, school district in a position where they do not have to generate that $565,000 from other sources in the township, such as houses, such as the houses that we all live in, including me. Um, the annual net township impact, because there are some things deducted from that, and that's in this study, is about $100,000. Not as significant, but significant. So that's to the bottom line of the township, it's $100,000 a year in impact. The total annual combined impact is $664,890 in taxes. So that's the benefit between the township and the school district, $665,000. So basically it helps fund the ability of this township to do business, the ability of the school district to do business, and the ability for them to do it at, without raising taxes. This last slide um, just shows a number of projects in Montgomery County kind of over the last 10 years and what their densities are. It was provided by the Montgomery, Montgomery County Planning Commission. As you can see, they range from 140 units to the acre down to about 23 and a half units to the acre. Our proposed maximum density is 36 units to the acre, which is kind of right in the middle of the whole thing. Um, the one thing that's not indicated on here is this is senior, so obviously the traffic impact is significantly less than a lot of these that I think maybe two or three of them are senior. But So, so as far as the density in, in the projects done in Montgomery County over the last 10 years, it's, it's actually just below the middle of, of what's being proposed around the county. So as far as the county is concerned, it's not on the high end, it's not the lowest, it's kind of right in the middle. And with that, I would like to bring up John Kennedy. Um, who's going to talk about his planning report? John, do you want to on the zoning map? Oh, you want the zoning oh, yeah. map? Okay. I'll just sit here. Sit okay. On. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Mr. Kenny, if you could just give a brief overview of your credentials. Sure. My name is uh, John H. Kennedy. I'm the principal uh, and owner of Kennedy Associates Planners and Landies Consultants, located in Harleysville. Uh, I have a um, Bachelor of Science in Environmental Design, have practiced planning for just coming up on 39 years. I'm a member of the uh, American Planning Association, the Pennsylvania Planning Association, uh, the American Institute of Certified Planners, and I have sat on, uh, been members of two planning commissions. And Mr. Kennedy, you're familiar with the zoning ordinance and the zoning map in Abington Township? Yes, I am. And you uh, were the author of the proposed text amendment that's before the commission this evening to establish the new H-12 senior apartment use? I, I did prepare the initial draft and we had a lot of input from the uh, Montgomery County Planning Commission and also the township staff. And does the um, draft that's before the commission this evening reflect the comments from the 
Township staff and the Montgomery County Planning Commission that you have incorporated into it? Uh, yes, in addition to comments received just from the general public uh, at Planning Commission meetings. Okay. Planning Commission meetings. So let's run through and, and give the uh, Commission a brief overview uh, of the proposed text amendment. Sure. Uh, the uh, proposed text amendment um, would create a new use for the zoning ordinance and that would be a use H-12 senior apartment units. And that would be a use that would only be permitted by conditional use in the AO district. So that is important um, in the sense that it allows an additional uh, layer of review, so to speak. There would have to be another hearing that would take place if this ordinance were adopted uh, and the H-12 is applied and at that point in time, the uh, Board of Commissioners could evaluate the actual layout with much more detail than what has been presented here this evening. Uh, and if deemed uh, necessary and desirable, the commission, Board of Commissioners could impose commission, uh, conditions on the uh, approval of the use. Then after that, there would still need to be uh, a standard land development application made. Uh, there's a number of um, special regulations, development standards, which are required to be able to utilize the H-12. It would not be applicable everywhere in the township where the AO district exists. Uh, the primary control would be the fact that there needs to be, the, the property needs to be located within 2,000 feet of a hospital. And a hospital is a defined term in your zoning ordinance. There are two hospitals, uh, Abington and Holy Redeemer. So it would really only be anything that is zoned uh, AO currently, and it would have to be located within 2,000 feet of one of the hospital properties. There are some other standards, too, which further limit the use. Uh, the tract would have to have 300 feet of uninterrupted frontage on two public roads, at least one of the roads would have to be a primary road. Uh, there would have to be access to public transportation, uh, which could include a rail station or a bus stop within 400 feet of the property. Uh, and also there, uh, the track could not have more than one dwelling that was last used as a single family home. Uh, that, was, that was a fairly recent addition and that was to um, address some fears that some neighbors had that people could, for instance, buy up a group of single family homes, get it rezoned HO, uh, either near Abington Hospital or near Holy Redeemer and put up a senior uh, apartment complex. So um, then the, the next item in the ordinance is uh, the table of dimensional requirements, which is included in every district in your ordinance. And that basically sets up all the dimensional standards. Uh, so the, as Mr. Markman said, the density would be 24 units per acre. There are density bonuses that I'll discuss in a minute, which would allow increases. The minimum tract area and minimum site area is five acres. Uh, minimum width is, three, is 100 feet. Uh, there's a front yard minimum of 15. Uh, side yard minimum of 25 feet, rear yard minimum of 20, uh, 25 feet. Uh, then there's a series of uh, requirements for parking, uh, building coverage maximum 50%, impervious coverage maximum of 65%, and green area minimum of 35. I, I would point out that in your ordinance, green area is virtually the inverse of the impervious coverage. Um, for maximum height, uh, 50 percent, uh, but 40, per, 40 or 50 feet, I'm sorry, uh, 40 feet for portions of the building that are within 100 feet of residential district boundary, uh, minimum building separations of 50 feet, uh, maximum length, uh, which is 160 feet, but up to 380 feet with required breaks and offsets. This is something that uh, the Montgomery County Planning Commission had a lot of input on. Um, and basically, uh, anything that is over 160 feet, uh, but less than 300, shall have a series of five-foot minimum offsets. Uh, and they have to occur every 100 feet. If the building is greater than the 300 feet, 
uh, there has to be a major break, which would be a very deep break in the facade, and that has to create a courtyard that is no less than 400 square feet and is landscaped. The next portion of the ordinance is the actual definition of uh, the senior apartment unit, H12, which is basically very, very similar to your current um, definition of apartment unit. So we're not, we're not reinventing the wheel here. Uh, and then this following section goes into the density bonuses. And just to discuss density a little bit, uh, the base density for, for use H12 is 24 units per acre, as I stated. That's the same as a use in your ordinance uh, known as E10, which is a um, uh, continuing care uh, type facility. Um, it, it has been suggested, why not just utilize uh, E10? Um, and one of the reasons why and why we're proposing this particular use is that E10, a life care, is not really the same as this type of use. And we feel that uh, that this type of use is something that is lacking in the township at this point, and there is a great demand for it. The primary difference is, is that E10 is a life care. It includes, in fact, mandates a certain level of care involved with it. So there would be medical care involved. And it, it involves uh, uh, many more employees, for instance. There would be skilled nursing associated with it. Um, and there would also be things such as common dining areas and completely different facilities than you would have in an apartment building. But one of the major differences that I think is very important, uh, and any of you who have parents that you have um, placed in life cares would understand, is that this represents a different financial option for seniors. Uh, it, it, in a life care scenario, you basically sell your house, you take that entire lump of money, and you give it to the life care company. With a senior apartment, you have much more flexibility. You can sell your home, you can only spend a small amount at a time, and you're allowed to preserve your capital and preserve your flexibility. And that's one of the reasons why I think this is actually an important uh, use for in the township. Uh, I'll get into the aging population in just a minute, but I do think that there is a significant need for this in the township. So the reason why the bonuses were, were added is to take the base density and then encourage uh, a higher quality type project in terms of landscaping, in terms of architecture, and in terms of uh, sustainable construction practices and management practices. So this is something that we have done and we, we find this in many other ordinances. I've actually used this very similar type uh, mechanism uh, in Upper Dublin. Uh, we have a, a project, a senior project in Limerick Township not too long ago, which also incorporated some bonuses. Uh, so it, it's something that you do see. Uh, the Planning Commission where I uh, serve in Lower Salford, we also have used this in some uh, ordinances too. Uh, so basically, I won't go through this in great detail, but uh, there's a series of bonuses, uh, and they include things such as enhanced building materials, improved public space, which would be public areas that are accessible to the general public, common open space, which would be uh, areas that are landscaped and finished that are open to residents. One thing I would note here, as I said, your green area uh, in Abington is the inverse of impervious. So what that means is that if somebody builds a plaza and landscapes it, that's not green area. That's considered impervious coverage, even though it's a finished, a highly finished landscape. So this is a way that it would encourage developers to create finished landscape areas. Uh, De-emphasizing parking, structured parking. Uh, one of the things that we are uh, proposing in this would be to put large amounts of the parking below grade. That is one of the changes that happened in discussions with the county uh, and with staff. And that obviously is something that is quite expensive, but not only does it hide the parking, it also has the effect of lowering the heights of the building, which was one of the comments that we heard at many of the planning commission meetings. 
uh, bonuses for decorative streetscape, for alternative energy sources, um, energy efficiency, uh, and then also some bonuses for educational resource and community heritage preservation. That's what Mr. Markman just described with respect to the cemetery. Uh, and then also there would be a potential bonus for off-site traffic improvements. Now, each and every one of these bonuses would be evaluated by you at the conditional use uh, time at the hearing. So that gives you actually a great deal of control over which bonuses could be awarded and exactly how they would be described and how they would be applied on the project. Um, then there are some, some other uh, design requirements uh, of, the, um, of the, the senior apartment use itself, uh, minimum uh, apartment sizes and such, which is the same as your, very similar to your uh, apartment use uh, in your current ordinance. Uh, and then we also have uh, landscape buffering requirements and parking requirements. Um, Mr. Kennedy, um, does that accurately uh, summarize this uh, proposed uh, H-12 senior housing use? It does. And in your professional opinion as a land planner, is it in the best interest of this township to create this new type of use? Yes, I believe it is. And why is that? I think that, it, as I stated uh, a few minutes ago, it offers uh, a completely different option that is not found in the township at this point. Uh, it also, it, it, we'll get into this a little bit uh, later, but it also would allow uh, seniors uh, access to medical care and transportation. Um, and I think that it is in the best interest of the township, in my opinion. Now, to implement this um, as this use is being proposed by conditional use in only the AO zoning district, the subject property would need to be rezoned to AO. Is that correct? That's correct. And in your, uh, you're familiar with the current zoning of the property? Uh, I am. And um, you're familiar with the zoning district surrounding the property? Uh, I am. Right. In fact, right here we can see the illustration. Uh, the, the site is um, outlined in this uh, dark blue line. Uh, we can see that the site is actually split zone. Part of it is CS, community service, and R3, medium density residential. Uh, surrounding it, it's located on the Old York Road corridor and then also on Susquehanna Road. So it's a, it's a highly visible site in the center of, of the central portion of uh, the township. And so it is surrounded by a variety of different zoning districts, uh, AO across the street, uh, also the Main Street low density, um, some more CS across the street, uh, R4, R3, and then just down here we have uh, Main Street high density. And in your professional opinion as a land planner, is it appropriate to rezone this property to AO? Yes, in my opinion it is. And why is that? I, I think um, this, this is really an important property, which I know all of you know, and I know all the residents who are here this evening know. It's a highly visible property in a highly visible part of the township. Uh, in this particular situation, we have a use which has served the community well over the years, but the use is going away. So this, this property will be developed one way or another. So the question is, what would be an appropriate use and what would be a use that would not have a large negative impact on the community as a whole? And I think uh, that's where the senior apartment use really is ideal. Uh, regardless of the size of this, square foot for square foot, this is a very, very low impact use uh, for this location. Uh, directly across the street, we already have an area of AO. This would not only allow seniors to have access to um, the services and goods that they would need, but it also would really provide a lot of um, business for local businesses in the area. You have seniors moving in who have disposable income, and they can start to support the, the stores directly up and down Old York Road. 
Uh, also, in addition, the, the site is within um, easy walking distance of several other institutions, such as churches, synagogues, and, and libraries. So I think that this is uh, an appropriate use for the area. I think AO is appropriate. Uh, you also have heard some of the advantages in terms of economic benefit and traffic benefit. And in my opinion, this would be a far better, far more desirable use than uh, something else that would go in here, which would be some developers might suggest something like retail on such a major corner. I don't think that would be appropriate here. Ms. Kennedy, a few final questions. In your professional opinion, is this proposed rezoning consistent with the township's comprehensive plan? Yes, it is. We examined both the uh, township's comprehensive plan, which was um, published in two th or adopted in 2007, and also the Montgomery County plan. And it is consistent with both of those comprehensive plans, in my opinion. Now, in the binder we've marked as A2, uh, there are four documents I just want to bring to your attention. Uh, first, marked as A23, is a summary that you prepared by memo dated December 7, 2018. Do you recall that summary? Uh, yes. And that contains the recent revisions to the proposed text amendment. Um, that transpired over the last last month or two, correct? That that is correct, and the fair majority say, of these. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, fair to say the revision since we were here last before this commission. Yes. Okay. And you've summarized these in the memo. We don't need to go through each one, but in your opinion, have you uh, incorporated these comments into the text amendment you reviewed this evening? We have, and the only one I would point out is that the the most major revision is the fact that this is now a conditional use. Okay. And marked A24 is a planning report. Um, does this contain uh, your findings and opinions as you've recently testified to as to the appropriateness of adopting the text amendment and the uh, rezoning? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, A7 is a response to a Montgomery County Planning Commission review letter dated December 6, 2018. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. You've received numerous uh, letters from the Montgomery County Planning Commission over this process, is that correct? Yes, we have. And this is the latest one, and you've addressed um, in, uh, in your reply all of their comments, correct? Uh, yes, I have. They, they have recommended approval of this, and um, in my opinion, we can easily comply with all these comments. However, it would be something that would be done at the uh, conditional use or the land development phase. So Montgomery County Planning Commission has recommended the adoption of this text amendment and the rezoning, is that correct? Yes, they have. And then all the comments they had in their last letter, which are down to uh, a handful of comments, could all be incorporated into the plans as part of the conditional use hearing, correct? That is correct. And then finally, there's a reply memo from you to a letter from the Abington Township Environmental Advisory Council that's dated December 10, 2018. Uh, are you familiar with uh, their letter and your reply? Yes, I am. And uh, have you attempted in your reply to address all of their comments? I have, and again, I think that a lot of these comments can easily be integrated in uh, at the uh, conditional use uh, and the land development phase. Okay. okay. That's all I have uh, for Mr. Kennedy. Okay. And uh, at this time, Mr. Chairman, that's, uh, that's our presentation. Thank you very much. Yes. All right, at this time, uh, before we proceed, I was wondering, do any of the commissioners, before I get into comments, need any of the um, uh, graphics by the uh, applicant that are displayed here? Because Mr. Manfredi may want to raise the screen, you said, to put some more chairs? Okay, uh, before I uh, do that, could we take a brief, uh, Nathan, a one, two minute in intermission so we can move some chairs in for residents who are standing out in the hallway, please? Thank you. Nathan, if we could um, resume our meeting at this time. Uh, we'd like to turn the lights off so these people won't be inconvenienced by that light glaring in their eyes. Uh-oh. You might want to duck first. <laughs> We're having a little technical difficulties. Yeah. 
Yeah, as near as we could tell that there's something on that screen. I don't know if people were touching this at another meeting, but this isn't working properly. If you, we don't need to have that up. You can turn it off so that people's, the light's not. Okay, that's fine. I think we could turn it off. I'm not sure, but anyway, we'll. Up to you guys. Okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, if I actually wanted to reference one thing, at, uh, and then, then after that we could turn it off if no one objects, but okay. I did want to at some point. All right, well, let's resume, and at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our solicitor, Mr. Michael Clark. Uh, thank you, uh, <clears throat> President Luker. Um, now that the applicant has uh, finished uh, their presentation, uh, this will be the opportunity for the board uh, to ask questions of uh, the applicant and all of the applicant's witnesses uh, that were uh, present this evening. It will also be the opportunity for the board to ask questions of the uh, township uh, consultants and uh, staff who are here uh, this evening. Uh, for the members of the public present this evening, there will be an opportunity uh, for uh, public comment, and that uh, opportunity for public comment will be made available to all the residents who are present. Uh, there will also be an opportunity for any um, member of the public who is uh, seeking party status uh, to uh, make, uh, present testimony and to ask uh, questions of any of the uh, witnesses who are present this evening from the applicant. Uh, party status will uh, be granted to any uh, resident who lives within uh, four blocks of the uh, impacted and affected properties. Uh, anyone who is outside of that four block area but still desires to have party status will need to come forward and state the basis for their request uh, for party status. At that point, uh, the applicant's attorney, Mr. Gunlock, will either uh, object or not object to that person uh, receiving party status, and if he objects, then a ruling will have to be made uh, by the township as to whether or not that person gets uh, party mm -hmm. status. So just to be clear, uh, party status is different from public comment. Uh, if you're present this evening and you want to make a comment, you can do that. Uh, but if you want to ask questions of the witness, of the witnesses and of the applicant, or if you want to present your own testimony separate from public comment, um, you have to uh, have party status. So after the board is done questioning, it would be appropriate at that time to ask which members of the public are, are seeking party status, and then we can move forward from there. Thank you, sir. So at this time, can I follow up a question on that? Uh, yes, Vice President Klein. So, uh, Solicitor Clark, so party status, um, we have a proposed uh, zoning text amendment and map change, um, which is presented at this point for this property that is the subject property. However, there might be other properties that are uh, affected by this proposal. Um, would it be would it be safe to assume that those properties would also uh, be open to uh, people having party status if they're within the same proximity of those. If you're within four blocks, <laughs> uh, Commissioner Klein, of one of the affected properties from this text amendment and this uh, map amendment, you will be granted party status because although um, you uh, may, <laughs> we only have one proposal in front of us this evening, um, if this is going to impact another property, um, the residents who live within four blocks of that other property should be permitted to ask questions. Obviously, uh, the applicant cannot speak to specifics regarding those other properties. The applicant is not proposing to put this, uh, bu these buildings or th this uh, project on those other properties, uh, but if they have some general questions about um, those other properties, they would be able to ask questions about that property. But specific questions to this applicant about another property within the district would not be appropriate. Right. But more of my, <coughs> excuse me, more of my concern is that those that believe that they are within that distance of a property that may be affected by the end result of this text amendment um, would also have the ability to um, grant party status. That's correct. And is it appropriate for the applicant at this time to designate or to at least give us an idea of what other properties that are currently zoned AO that may fall within the requirements of this text amendment? I think if that's a question from you, Commissioner Klein, it's entirely appropriate. So can I, um, before we start to 
ask questions if the board doesn't mind. I would like to get an answer from the applicant as to what properties they believe may be affected by this proposed text amendment that are currently zoned AO. Uh, you know, I believe that the <coughs> only other property that's currently zoned AO, uh, that's when the distance of a hospital would be the Meadowbrook Apartments. Um, so essentially, if, if Meadowbrook Apartments wanted to tear down a piece of Meadowbrook Apartments and rebuild, they potentially could under this ordinance. So I would say Meadowbrook Apartments is that property. One other question. So there is an, I think there, believe there is a piece of property zoned AO that's near Elkins Park Hospital or Rolling Hill as I remember it. Um, is that correct? Mark, maybe you can answer that. Or I just want to be clear that we're going to, I know it's outside the township, but it still would be within potentially that distance. I think it's the Valley Glen Apartments, Mark. Valley Glen, we were talking about Fox Chase Cancer Center. Fox Chase Cancer Center, I forgot what the terminology was. Um, okay. Is well, it the, possible the, that that's within that same distance? I'd, I'd, I'd defer to Mr. Penical. He seems to know the zoning. Would that be potentially, is how many acres is, I guess Valley Glen is probably. Valley Glen is a substantial site. Uh, 11 buildings outside amenities pool, ring road, parking. So technically, I guess Valley Glen, okay. if, if it could be torn I down. I just want to make sure yeah. that we have okay. those That's, spots. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So Valley Glen, and, and which is on Township Line, and the uh, Meadowbrook Apartments are potential subjects of the text amendment. All right, thank you. Okay. At this <coughs> time, I'd like to open it up for comments, questions from commissioners. Uh, Commissioner John Spiegelman. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, before I start, I'm actually you know, I'm really just going to dive in with a question that my other questions will sort of be moot without this one. Um, could someone from the applicant um, please put back up the very last, I think it's the, ver the chart, the comparables chart, the Montgomery County uh, development uh, density chart on the last page of the display. Um, all right, so the, I've, I've, you know, a lot of us have, have been here and seen a lot, uh, a lot of the elements of this presentation throughout this whole process. This is a new piece that I haven't seen before. I'd, I don't know if it's going to have the effect that you, <laughs> that the applicant wants it to have. Um, so obviously here we have, you know, clearly on this chart, the, the requested density is lower than a whole lot of these other items. Now, none of these other locations is in Abington, and um, I'm looking for Upper Moreland here, and I don't see it, and I'm wondering, just this is a, I'm wondering if the applicant happens to know what the density is of the property that people have brought up throughout the course so, of time. Yes. The, what I call the beast. So, so the Upper Moreland Eleven project. So let me just start by saying, first of all, it's not an age-restricted project. It's a market-rate apartment right, project. Right. Second of all, it's five stories height, right. where this is yeah. three and four stories. It's a very similar size site. This is 5.6 acres. That's 5.9 acres. Right. We're proposing 180 age-restricted apartments here. That property has 275 non-age-restricted apartments on it. In addition to that, it has 23,000 square feet of commercial space, which produces additional traffic. Right. So if you want to compare it, it's basically almost 100 units bigger plus 23,000 square feet of leasable commercial space, substantially bigger. Uh, I would say that the, the density there is in excess of 50 units the acre plus 23,000 square feet of commercial. It's a property that looms heavily on everyone's yes. mind, myself included. Um, so as I said, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna dive into this. Um, I know based on your original uh, density requests from uh, the better part of a year ago. Uh, I know the, the number has come down significantly. Um, however, the fact remains that this number is a full 50% over the ceiling established, uh, the, the, the max established in, the, in AO zoning in the township zoning ordinance, 50% over literally over the top. Um, as I said, I have a whole bunch of other questions, but I, I, they're all gonna be moot without this one. Um, can you bring this density down? Will you, will you bring, 
I don't know if I should ask or, or tell because this is this is the this is the point. So I, I guess the first question I want to ask I, because it's it's this has come up, and I guess. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Markman, could you please turn off all your cell phones and other electronic devices, please? Thank you. So, so I guess the question I would have is, in your mind, is, is, is there, under this current density, are you saying this is not a text amendment that you, you individually could support? Because that... I'll answer your question. Um, there's, a lot about, there's a lot about this project that I think is great. A lot of, about this project that I do support, um, but this for for many people, not everybody, but many people that I've spoken to of, over the course of the last year, including since the the major revision when the density request was dropped down to this current level, um, fifty percent over the max established in our township zoning ordinance is. I mean, again, it's literally over the top. It's a bridge too far. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're, you're a builder. Can yeah. you build a better bridge, a bridge that's not too far? So I can tell you this is something that we've talked about internally and weighed heavily on because I think density keeps coming up. And we've looked at the project. And, and you know, when you look at these things, you, you kind of – you teeter on the edge of viability, what's viable, what's not, because we don't sell these. We own these for the long run. And, you know, Bruce Toll and myself will own this for the next 30 to 40 years. And residents of the township, we want to own it because we drive by it. And we will be involved with it, as we always are. I, this I, is, I, 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 appreciate, I, this I do is, appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. And I, I, I no, apologize I for interrupting. I'm not going to make a, a habit of that, but I see... I see the word density in my sleep now at this point. <laughs> so, I can so point to it a million times without even really looking, without even breaking eye contact with you. I can point to it a million times in this room. No, um, it, it takes, okay, not a million, hyperbole. It takes, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes it takes me a long time to, to get a point. This process has been going on for over, for, for almost a year, and I, I, I honestly think every bit of it has been valuable. It's been long, it's been difficult, but I think it's been valuable. But, you know, through that, that word density has managed to get its way through my <laughs> thick skull. Okay. And most recently via the Planning Commission. So, all right. All right I will not interrupt. So, so. Several commissioners, you know. So we, we sat and we've looked at this for the last couple of months because I know it's a huge concern. And what, what we can do is take it down to the kind of lowest viable density that we think that this will be a successful project. And I can tell you, we usually start with 200 units. We're at 180 now due to the fact that we own the Abington Shopping Center, so we have staff in the area. We own the Rydal Park office building, we own the Dublin Terrace apartments, we have other apartments in Upper Dublin, we have other people around so the expenses can be curtailed a bit. We, we could and would be willing to change the ordinance. Um, and what we looked at was under life care facility, uh, it's currently 24 units to the gross acre. I, I can't get quite there, but what I would be willing to do and put on the table if, if the commissioners would be you know, amenable to it would be Instead of a minimum of 24, which we currently have, I'd be willing to drop that to 20, 20 units to the acre as a minimum. And as my maximum density, meaning that with my bonus provisions, I'd be willing to do a maximum density. I can't get, get it's 20 units to the gross acre. I can't get, quite get to the 24 units to the gross acre that's in life care, but I can get to the 26. And that could give me a project that's viable. So essentially what I'd be willing to do is put a floor of 20 with the bonus provisions, 26 units per gross acre, as opposed to 36 units. So I would drop, I would drop it by 10 units and do 20 or, or 26, and then, and then, you know. What number does that get you to overall, translate it? That would translate to a maximum number of units if we hit the bonus of 145. Currently it's 180. So it'd be dropped from 100, maximum of 180 to 145 units. 
based on the 5.6 acres. And if that's, if that's something that the commissioners are amenable to, I will put that on the table to be considered as part of your vote. All right, thank you. Um, I, I'm actually gonna hold off on my other questions. I, really, I gotta have to process this. And I also realize I, I didn't really let, <laughs> invite Commissioner Sanchez to weigh in at all. I mean, this is the ward he represents, so I do apologize for that. But I, I hope I wasn't jumping the gun on you. Okay, did all the commissioners uh, get those numbers that Mr. Markman just passed out? Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Sanchez. I think Commissioner Spiegelman nailed it there. The, you know, the concern that, I mean, many concerns have been expressed. The one that resonates and has resonated has been density. So that's a you know, significant uh, address of that question right there. Um, density, you know, of course, has many meanings, many meanings I've wrestled with over the time because when it's not adding more cars in the existing use, I'm, you know, kind of perplexed with the, uh, the in-between on density, but that's definitely, I mean, moving it down is definitely the right direction. So thank you for that, Commissioner Spiegelman. Okay, uh, any, any other comments or questions from commissioners? Pardon me, thank you to the applicant for okay. also reducing. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, on, the, on the bonus credits that you're uh, recommending, I'm wondering if we could maybe consider a couple, of, a couple other options. Um, two other things that have come up in the conversations from the residents of the area have been the historic preservation, the preservation of the, the YMCA, or at least the facade. Um, that seems like it might be worth some bonus credits to me. Um, and the other thing that's come up fairly frequently is this topic of affordable housing in the township. You know, a, a minimum ratio, 5%, 10%. Um, is there any willingness to add those into the mix of bonus credits? You know, I, I am not sure I can achieve that. Um, I understand that that's something, to build this to the level, um, you know, the rents are not gonna be of that level and I just probably couldn't have the units. And then as far as the existing YMCA, um, you know, we've, we've looked at the building and we've tried to figure out a way to, to reuse it and just where it sits and the current configuration and the potential reusability. And I completely understand that it's something that people have brought up and we, we kind of contorted the best we could to take a look at it. Um, yeah, I mean, Matt, do you want to address that? Because we, we, we've taken that seriously. We just have not, I mean, he, Matt can get into it um, because it's something that we tried to figure out. Sure, I mean, we looked at the position of the building on the site, the floor to floor heights, the fact that we were doing a lot of uh, underground parking and the existing building, um, the, the way that it sits and, and where it's uh, currently positioned, it, it's just, it's almost impossible for us to, to reuse it and, and still um, create a, a, a viable project um, from our perspective. So. What about just the, the facade? I mean, we see it all the time in Center City where you're <coughs> propping up the facade and integrating it into a larger streetscape. Right, but that would be uh, pushing um, the facade of our building like back an additional like 30, 40 feet for a, a stretch of um, like the width of the facade. Um, we, at, at one point we did look at trying to save elements of the facade to kind of relocate. And I mean, that's still something that like we, we could study, but it's nothing that we could like guarantee. Like it's not until you really get into the building that you know whether or not you're gonna be able to. Seems to me if we're gonna change the massing by dropping the density, then we may have an opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something we can look at with the lower density, but. Yeah, so, so I guess, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll commit to look at it again, you're right, with the lower density. I think in the way the ordinance reads right now, the historical preservation part of it could actually, that if the commissioners would like it, that could be incorporated into that provision for the bonus density. Um, so I can tell you, let me, look, let me go and look again and see if there's elements of it we can preserve because I completely understand what you're saying. It's been there a long time. It's a part of this community. So let me see if there's something I can do that you know, would be amenable if, if, in fact, it's passed prior to coming back for conditional use. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. 
Other commissioner questions? Commissioner Zappone and then Commissioner Carswell. I believe I asked this question before. The construction of this facility is a frame or masonry? Um, the construction facility, we, we haven't designed it yet, but it'll be designed in compliance with code, you know, under township code. Okay, so we, that, we haven't designed it. We that haven't. kind of confuses me because right now I'm erecting a $10 million two-story administration building. And months and months before our pre-bid meetings, we've had prints, scopes, and specs. We knew what we were building. So I don't understand you want us to approve something we don't even know what it's going to be constructed of. I, I'm completely baffled by that. Can I tell you, um, we are currently building 2 million square feet of space. When you go through the approval process, this early, early time of the approval process, you don't develop your architectural plans. We have concept <laughs> renderings. We will build to the concept renderings, but you don't design the building until you're through the development process. Th these buildings will cost us a million dollars to design and to spend the million dollars prior to the day I'm even, I don't even have zoning, just would not be cost effective or efficient for us. We would you know, potentially lose a lot of money in a lot <coughs> of situations. So I can tell you though, whatever the township code is, we are gonna build to the township code. So if the township code is masonry, we're gonna build the masonry. At the time we build, we will, we will design this building to whatever the township code is. So you have no idea right now, no idea at all, how this is going to be constructed. I, I do whatever, you know, there's, there's rules. In every township you have to look I, at I the know code. that, but, but so. you guys are putting something together, okay? You have to have an idea what it's going to be. I mean, I've been in this business for over 40 years, and I, I never heard of it. We knew months and months and six, eight months, a year before the, so, so the concept we had, we're, we're going to put up a building. Not, not to be disrespectful, Commissioner, because I, I, I just can't expend architectural dollars before I even know whether I have a project. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But I am not going to build it in any way except as required by the rules of this township. So when this building is designed, the, the architect will look at the township code and they will design it in accordance with the township code. And that's what you have to do every township. That's what we'll do here, and that's what we do everywhere else. So, <clears throat> okay, I think that's, that's it for right answer. now. Okay. I have others. Commissioner, Commissioner Luker, well. if I could just jump in for a second. So, I think to follow up on um, Commissioner Zappone's uh, questions and something for the, the public to know if the board were to approve this text amendment and this map amendment, the applicant would be back in front of the board uh, on at least uh, two more uh, occasions. Uh, they will need to uh, get the approvals by conditional use. So there will be a, a subsequent conditional use hearing, and then there will be the normal land development process. So while Commissioner Zappone has every right to be concerned about these questions, I don't want the public to understand, we will be addressing, the, if approved, we will be addressing these issues at a later date. Thank you, Mr. Solicitor. Commissioner Carswell. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Forgive me, this is my first time looking at something at this level of detail. So just, bit, where did you go? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know I would Already be the appropriate you. person so to answer. So, <laughs> okay, so um, I'm looking at the, um, the text amendment and okay. um, as it's uh, presented in what is page three of the draft where it says uh, use H12 senior apartment units in the description. Mm -hmm. I noted that nowhere in that description or elsewhere in here, it specifically um, outlines 55 years and up. And in looking through our ordinance, um, it's, a, it's a, new, um, a new description, I guess, um, because we have um, other, the senior, give me a second. The senior neighborhood is a different type of definition. So I wanted to ask if that's um, um, an omission or something that we need to specify here. You, you know, and I guess I have to look at it. Um, it's it's a senior, and I'm just looking at the ordinance. Yeah, yeah, here it is, Michael. It does say the unit shall be age restricted in compliance with the Federal Fair Housing Act, which does allow the 55 and over age restrictions. Right, so the units will be age restricted in compliance with the Federal Fair Housing Act. I believe that does, that is 55, but okay. I, I can reiterate that it'll be 55 and older, so. Yeah. Okay, do you mind if I continue with another question? Okay, another question. Uh, I've lost my first page. 
All right. So in the, um, what's page two, in the chart where it has the density and then it has tracked minimum area five acres? Yes. Okay. So then on page four, forgive me for everyone who's not. Yeah, I noticed this. that tonight too. It says it shall be. Four the minimum acres? is four acres, and that's an inconsistency. That was, that was a typo. That, that was a typo that was submitted. That should say five acres. Okay. So the minimum was increased to five acres. Okay. So for everybody else, if you're not following along on page four, <coughs> number seven, A, the minimum lot area per senior apartment unit development shall be, and it should be changed to, to five, five acres? five okay. acres, correct. Thank you. And maximum of eight. Good job. Okay. Oh, English <coughs> major. I caught the... <laughs> the one thing I thought might be a typo. Um, and then um, I asked this question of a fellow commissioner because this wasn't, this is not my uh, area of expertise, but I thought it would be a good discussion since there are probably plenty of other people in the room where it's not their area of expertise. Can you, um, or maybe if this is a township um, staff um, answer, can we talk about what happens if the property is built and then sold? what controls it being a 55 plus continue, um, staying as a 55 plus versus shifting to an apartment full of kids that um, join our elementary it? schools. I can have my attorney address yes. this. Um, if uh, you were to adopt this um, ordinance amendment and then we obtain conditional use approval as part of the conditional use approval, that would be one of the conditions that you would impose that appropriate documentation be put in place to confirm the age restricted housing in accordance with the Fair Housing, housing Act. Then we would obtain um, land development approval for the project and then there would be development documentation. As part of that development documentation, your solicitor would draft a development escrow agreement as long as, as well as a restrictive covenant to ensure that this housing uh, forever and in perpetuity um, be age restricted housing in accordance with the Fair Housing Act. In addition, we would prepare um, other documentation that your solicitor would review that would confirm that no school aged children would be permitted to reside in the property. So there would be a series of documentation that would be prepared and reviewed before the land development plan was recorded and before a building permit was issued. Okay, thank you. That's the last of my questions. Thank you. Vice President Klein, questions. Thank you, President. <clears throat> Thank you, President Luker. So a lot of my questions are centered around trying to get to the, uh, the idea of the density and how it affects the area and how it is uh, compliant or is in the spirit of the zoning ordinance that was passed. So I'm not 100% sure um, some of these things, how they proceed. So my first question is probably to the solicitor. Um, at this point, if the only change that was made to the ordinance uh, was potentially the density that was proposed by Mr. Markman. Is that considered a substantive change and would require re-advertising and, and, and a uh, reset of the process? It would not be. Because? Um, because it is a uh, numerical change <coughs> that is a downward deviation from what is originally being proposed. Uh, the purpose of the requirement to re-advertise is to make sure that anyone who has an interest in a potential project doesn't read the potential ordinance or read the advertisement and then something completely different is proposed uh, at the actual hearing where someone would not have notice. Um, we are not changing the ordinance substantively, we are just making a numerical change and it is a <coughs> downward numerical change so it would not require re-advertising. If we begin to get into any other changes to the ordinance, then we'll have to deal with that as it comes. But simply agreeing to change the density from 24 to 36 down to 20 to 26 would not require re-advertising. Okay. So I'm going to move on with a couple other questions and related to the zoning ordinance. Um, so the first thing I wanted to discuss is the bonus situation. So I have a lot of uh, concerns about some of the bonus um, provisions and how they're and why they're in here and how they're calculated. Um, and I guess considering the fact that you would be bringing the, the, uh, the delta between the, the floor and the ceiling to six, that the bonus structures or the bonus provisions that are in here um, are far in excess of that six. So I would like to just make some comments about it. Um, I would prefer that the bonus structure um, that you put in the, in the ordinance to make up the six has a 
uh, connection to some of the other bonus structures in our uh, current zoning ordinance that was adopted last year. And in that, I mean, I would like to um, have you relook at some of those bonus structures so that any of those um, ideas are as permanent as the density that would be granted through those bonus structures. And I'll give you an example. Um, whereas I like the idea of the community heritage preservation and the educational resource and the five-year funding, um, I, I, I like the idea. I think it's a, a worthy effort uh, by the developer. Um, it doesn't rise to the same um, the same standard of the additional bonus units that you would get from those because you would have those in perpetuity for whatever that means. Um, whereas, you know, specifically the education resource would run out in five years. Um, so I would like that to be looked at <coughs> and any other of these bonus structures um, or bonus provisions that they have a better connection to the ordinance because there are several lists of bonuses that we debated when passing the zoning ordinance. Um, so I don't know if, Mr. Kennedy, if you would like to respond sure. to any of that. Sure, I'll I... respond to, to <clears throat> some of those. Um, and, and we did actually get that uh, direction uh, when we met with staff and with Montgomery County Planning Commission, uh, especially, um, especially to look at uh, a couple different aspects of the other parts of the ordinance. One was the density bonuses which they are found in, in the MS and in the, in the business district, and then also uh, some of the streetscape standards too. We were referred back to the MS district uh, for that. And so several of these actually do reflect that. What I think becomes a little bit difficult is to maybe correlate them to the type of project you would build in an AO versus the type of project you might build in, in a Main Street district. Uh, and so we did try to adapt them uh, where we can. But for instance, um, uh, specifically things such as the um, uh, common open space and the de-emphasized parking in general, uh, those are things that, that we looked at some of the other uh, standards. Some of the businesses or some of the bonuses that we looked at, um, we just simply couldn't really utilize in, in an AO setting. Another one that we did get from, uh, from I guess the BC Business Center District was the, the bonus for increased impervious coverage. That same type of bonus mechanism is in that district. And, and the reason why we did that, as I explained, if somebody does a, a plaza, a hardscape with planters, and it's a lush looking landscape, under your ordinance, that does not count as green area. So we do want to encourage those types of spaces, but in order to do that, there may have to be some uh, slight increase in impervious coverage. So we did definitely um, uh, look at all the bonuses. I looked at all of them and I, I tried to adapt them where I could. Uh, whether this has to be, um, I'm, I'm not sure that I necessarily agree that they would have to be completely revamped if the bonus um, or if the, if the overall density is, uh, is sort of recalibrated, but that, that's something that I think the, the board, the entire board will just have to look at and decide. Well, I mean, just looking at the first page of bonuses, you're in excess of 15 dwelling units per acre um, in additional units based on those provisions, and then on the second page, you have another five units per acre, so you're basically looking at a bonus structure that could give you 20 units per acre, and obviously based on the discussion that was had with Commissioner Spiegelman, um, the delta we're talking about is only six. So I would ask that, <clears throat> I would assume something would have to change in here, or else you could achieve your bonus your six bonus units by only hitting two of these provisions. An another way you could look at this would be, uh, as I mentioned before, and I, and I mentioned and is stated in these in in the uh, text of the ordinance, because this is conditional use and because the township can uh, can actually create conditions under the MPC, providing that they're reasonable. I really don't see a reason why, for instance, after evaluating the exact application, 
some of these points could not be uh, divvied up, for instance, uh, under improved public space. Uh, maybe that's utilized to a certain extent, but the, the board con considers that the uh, conditional use hearing that it's only worth one and a half DU per acre. Uh, I mean, would, would that be a reasonable condition or way to? Sure, yep. So but, I, I think a lot a of that could be worked out Somewhat time. arbitrary. Well, I, I think, I think it, it all has to come down to, as you know, at a conditional use hearing, it's a little bit different. That's mm -hmm. where you're presenting things. And they would be in much greater detail. You know, for instance, you mentioned the, um, <coughs> the, the preservation and, and the heritage um, bonuses. Uh, that would be something that would have to have a much more detail laid out in terms of exactly what the program would be, what the goals of the program would be, what the funding of the program <laughs> would be, the time frame, and all those things would have to be included. And the board may decide, you know, it, it, it may say, uh, uh, one and a half, for instance, and one for, for community heritage, and one and a half for resource, which would be uh, three DU per acre, the board might say, you're, you're not quite there, the both of them together are only worth 2.0 or 1.5. I mean, I, I don't really see why that could not be a condition that is, uh, that is applied. Well, I, I've given you my concern. I'll add one other thing onto there so that we don't Understood. have to keep going back and forth on this. Um, my other overriding concern is that similar to the bonus structures that are in the rest of the zoning ordinance, um, I, would, I would prefer not to incorporate um, new bonus structures or new bonus provisions that may be, um, for lack of a better term, exploited by somebody else coming in for a text amendment later on. And I would like to maintain some consistency. Um, it was a, it was a in-depth conversation when going through the bonus structures for the Main Street District and the BC District mm -hmm. when we drafted the zoning ordinance and passed it. And so I would leave you with that that uh, concern on, as, as far as I'm, my concern in that situation. And I'll move on from there. Very good. So I did have uh, a, couple of, a couple other questions for you, Mr. Kennedy, if, if you don't mind, President. Sure, Parker. go ahead. So um, planning. Um, I know we've known each other for quite a while, and I know you've yes. been, been around the block a few times. Uh, so my question for you is um, the idea of planning uh, especially when you deal with a comprehensive plan or a zoning ordinance, um, centers around areas or neighborhoods or um, districts in a township and not necessarily looking at specific properties. Would you say that's a fair assessment of how a township may approach a planning document such as a zoning ordinance or a comprehensive plan? Yes, that's one component of it, absolutely. So mm -hmm. in the sense that we... Uh, the, the, the Board of Commissioners and um, all the other bodies and the people that were involved in the zoning ordinance, would you say it's fair to, fair to say that our consideration for the density that was discussed in, for lack of a better term, the triangular area that is bordered by Old York Road, Susquehanna, and the fairway, um, the density was, and I can attest to it, was discussed as a area and not specifically as a density related to a specific property. If it, well, if you, if you say so, if you say right, that's but how I'm it's saying, done. But okay. that would be a fair assessment that, of, that a, would be of a, a reasonable good planning, way of a to, good planning uh, method. That, that would be a reasonable way to, uh, one of the ways to examine it. Okay. Um, and then um, you had mentioned uh, age restriction is another way a an applicant or a developer can achieve age restriction other than a text amendment is to provide a deed restriction on the property as I guess in a similar way that Mr. Gunlack had described through the conditional use hearing. Is that correct? I, I don't think I described it that way, but no, that, no, would, no, no. that would be a way that one could create uh, <clears throat> an age restricted uh, development, sure. So is it possible, is it possible that a existing use um, or a portion of an existing use could be, you could be imposed on this property and age restricted at the same time through a deed restriction and not a zoning text amendment. Yes, that is possible. Okay. And the other question I had is on the CS zoning district. Um, 
You have a split zoned property of CS in the front, R3, closer to the houses on Huntington. Correct, yeah. Um, <clears throat> given the limited, given, given the limited um, uses that are allowable through those zoning district, through that zoning district, then let's, we all know that the R3 has very limited, mainly single family homes, medium density, medium density residential but that the CS district primarily deals with community service uses. And when I talk about those, I'm talking about like a community center, which is what they have now, daycare center, um, all the ones in the E section, which is a library, a life care mm -hmm. facility, which we've talked about briefly, place of worship, those kind of things. Anything outside of that would need one of two things. Is that correct? A variance or another text amendment proposal? Well, I, I am gonna disagree with one thing you said, and that is, you wouldn't uh, be the first one to disagree with me. <laughs> uh, in, I believe in both the CS and the R3, you are permitted to do E10, which is the life care That's at, right. at uh, 24 units per acre. Also in R3, you are permitted to do mobile homes at a unit of, at a density of uh, 8.7 DU per acre. Right. So, I, so in other words, I would not characterize R3 as a, as a low density area. I would call it more of a, uh, medium to high density area. You are correct. I'm, I don't know all the specific uses for the resident for the R3 section. I only looked at the CS, but it's fair to say that. And and by the way, the mobile home is an aspect. You can verify this is is something that the zoning ordinance has to include it, based on that the, it does. Home, yes, based and on the municipal's planning code, it's correct. one of those protected uses. That's correct. So, but outside of those life care facility, which yes, is an allowable use under CS. Anything else like retail, um, an office building, um, a hospital building for that, well actually a hospital building might, but, but anything outside of those would have to come back to the township through one of two avenues, a variance request through the zoning hearing board or another text amendment proposal to the board of commissioners. If the zoning was not to be changed, that would be correct. Okay. Those would be the options. Um, I think at this time that's what I have for uh, Mr. Kennedy. Um, I do have other questions for other okay. witnesses, so I'll we yield for right now. All right, thank you. Any other questions from okay. Commissioner Vahey and then Commissioner Coswell and then Commissioner Schreiber? Okay, I'm not sure who these questions, this question is best directed to. Okay. Um, so we, uh, there's a potential agreement to reduce the density of the property. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, and uh, as I've indicated previously to you, uh, I mean, one of my bigger concerns is the massing of the property, the building on the property. Um, with the reduced density, you can still have the same size building, just less but bigger apartments. So is there been any consideration about, you know, decreasing the impervious surface and decreasing the building size to go along with the reduced density? Um, with the reduced density, we'd have to kind of rework the plan and relook at it. So that is definitely a consideration. Sure. <clears throat> um, I mean, this text amendment would not just apply to your proposal, but potentially other proposals at other properties. And I would want the text amendment to reflect that with a lower density, that there would have to be less impervious coverage. And I don't know what that actually looks like and how that should be reflected in the ordinance. Yeah, I mean, I guess we have not received a request to change the impervious coverage, I would have to just rework, I would have to rework the plan and take a look at it. So I don't even know, I don't know where it would end up at this point. Understood. So, um, and we've been asked to reduce the density, so. I get yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but this is a late development and something I'm mm -hmm. just thinking of now. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, something I would like to see in whatever I vote on. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. okay. Commissioner Coswell, Commissioner Schreiber. Okay, another thing I forgot, I'm sorry. On page three, it's the fourth bonus, the de-emphasized de parking. My understanding, if you look at the AO code, as it, or I mean the AO um, description as it is now, already has the expectation, forgive me, I gotta flip to it. Already has the expectation that parking is to the side and rear of the building. So in my understanding would be, and maybe this is a question actually for township staff, is that, okay, so in the ordinance it says, parking shall be located to the side or rear of the principal building. This says all surface parking is located to the side or rear of the building. 
while they're not identical words, they sound very similar. So I'm wondering right. if that and shouldn't one, be a bonus. One of the reasons why that was in there was it was a suggestion from the county planners. And I didn't catch that it was in the first part. It's, it's, it's very early on in the AO district. Okay. So can we, can we assume that that should come off the list of bonuses? It could either come off or the, the commissioners could simply not award it. Okay. You, 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 one thing to keep in mind is that because this is a conditional use, um, a, a project would, would come before you and there would then be a, a formula uh, there would be a base density. Now what's been put on the table is 20 units per acre. Uh, and then there would be a list of improvements that are proposed and how those, how those improvements um, would be implemented on the property. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get into imposing the conditions and picking and choosing which ones to, um, to utilize. So it, um, I think that one was really just a miscommunication with the county but um, certainly it could just not be utilized by the, the board. One, one thing I will say, I, I just, if I could go back to the impervious coverage uh, comment. Right now, we're, we are pretty much in line with, um, with the E10 use. However, uh, we probably realistically- what Sorry to interrupt, E10 is the managed care use? Is that correct? The, the life care use. Thank you. Right. Um, and pretty much what it would mean, the project as defined, designed now with the 180 units does need to utilize the bonus for the slight increase, increase in impervious coverage. There's, a, I think, a maximum of six, and we're, we would need something like 2.5% more. Reducing the density, we wouldn't necessarily have to change the ordinance, but we wouldn't need to utilize that ordinance, the, the bonus at all. I understand that's a matter of economics, but I'm concerned about the language of the ordinance, which is my, my job. And so, no, I, I do understand. I that. I need that to be reflected in writing, not just a matter of, you know, finances. Oh, I'm sorry. I to, just to correct. Actually, our numbers are actually lower than the E10. I had I. I knew we were comparable, but the but the E10 right now, the maximum impervious coverage is seventy percent. So you can do a life care, actually in CS and, and uh, R3 at 70% impervious coverage. I don't really want to debate this with you, but my point is that if we're going to reduce the density, I do want to see a written reduction in the coverage that's in the ordinance. Because again, it's not just going to apply to this project, it could apply to other properties, and that's my right, concern. Right, right. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Carswell, are you finished? I, sorry, one more question. I think it's right. a clarification question. So I'm looking at you, Solicitor Clark, maybe you're the right person to answer this. Um, the, the, the conversation earlier that you had with Commissioner Klein about the bonus structure, um, correct me, somebody, if I'm wrong in understanding this. If, if this was adopted as is, you're saying the you, the planner, say your name again for me again. John Kennedy. John Kennedy, thank you. Um, Kennedy, you're saying that um, we as commissioners in the conditional use hearing would have the ability to say, we like what you've done here, but we think we'll only award uh, two of the three potential um, bonus uh, densities. Is that correct? That it would be, it would not be an in, automatic all three? In, in my experience, it, it could be, uh, it could be utilized that way. Certainly the intention, the way the ordinance is written, is to present you with information and you would either agree with uh, the fact that that bonus is applicable or not. I don't see why the, the notion of conditions could not be applied to the bonuses themselves. Okay. You, you may also run into, you, you could run across a, a situation potentially where you simply do not even accept a, a, a bonus that is, um, that is proposed. If the solution to get the bonus were minimal, too minimal, you could say you don't qualify for that. That's one of the advantages of the, of the conditional use process. Okay. Essentially, when they go through the conditional use process, if they are able to meet the requirements 
uh, laid out in the ordinance. Um, and they are, uh, the project that they are proposing is not shown to be detrimental to the health, safety, and welfare of uh, Abington Township. They would get their conditional use approvals. I think what Mr. Kennedy is saying is that when you're going through that process, as you're approving, you can place certain conditions on the, the project provided they are within the ordinance. You can't just start pulling conditions out of anywhere that you want. They have to be the objective standards that are in, that are in the or ordinance. Um, I understand the point that Mr. Kennedy is making, and I was going to make this point to all of you later on. If the board majority does not like one or two of these bonuses, um, notwithstanding what Mr. Kennedy is saying, which is accurate, my, perhaps my, rec no, my recommendation would be that you pull them out that you don't approve them. Um, uh, if they're in there and the applicant comes back and says, I'm able to meet all of this objective criteria that's in the ordinance, then I should be awarded uh, the, the, these density bonuses. Uh, they, they would uh, necessarily be entitled to them. And I think that goes back to Commissioner Klein's point that some of these become low-hanging fruit for the, for the applicant. So if there are some of these that you really don't like and eight of you really don't like it, uh, I would, would probably recommend that you pull them out. Thank you, Commissioner Schreiber. So not only is, was the original proposal dense, but I think so am I, so here we go. Um, so I understand what our solicitor said about this not being a substantial change that has to be re-advertised, re yet I hear um, with the numbers changing, I, and I know we're not, we're not actually voting on um, what the project looks like, but I think everybody, the audience here included, has a picture in mind that we were shown in, in various slides. So if we're going down in units, I'm thinking this picture changes, and um, from what uh, Commissioner Vahey was saying about the impervious surface as well, so at this point, I'm not really sure what it is that that's going, and then we might take some of these bonuses out too. So I think all this stuff's being thrown at us, and for me anyway, I'm feeling very confused on what we're actually voting on at this point. So I'm just putting that out there, that this is um, not quite what we came in here for, and our, this is not what our planning commission saw and what they decided on. And again, I, I just want to make sure everyone's clear. The elevations the applicant has shown us tonight are not part of what's in front of you tonight. You're not voting on the concept plan. It, they're nice looking pictures, um, but that's not what you're voting on. What you're voting on is literally the text in the text amendment and the map amendment. The subsequent um, uh, uh, conditional use hearing will now begin to give you a greater level of detail. Now they'll have engineering drawings and things along those lines. The, the land development process will be when you see exactly what the project is going to look like. It very well could look significantly different from what the applicant has presented this evening, but that's not what's in front of you this evening. So I understand that. I'm, I mean, I do understand that, despite me saying that I'm being dense here, but um, even with that, if we start pulling things out of here and the numbers that are in the thing that we're voting on have changed, we're not really seeing what we're voting on. We're not visually seeing what we're voting on, even though it's the text amendment. I know we're not voting on the pretty pictures. So far, the only thing we have in front of us now is the applicant's willingness to reduce the density. And based on the applicant's willingness to reduce the density, it is my opinion that that would not require re-advertising. As we get a little further down the road, and if the board wants to start pulling out some other things or adding some other things, then there may be a different opinion at that point in time as to whether or not that would require re-advertising. But a simple reduction in density from a maximum of 36 to a maximum of 26, I don't believe requires re-advertising. But there could be some other changes that you're proposing and we'll, to go back to Commissioner Spiegelman's bridge, we'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it. Can I just jump in behind Thompson. that? Because, uh, you know, we are, we are decreasing the density, uh, you know, and this is a zoning text amendment. So is the applicant offering to rewrite the text amendment and decrease the zoning as part of that text amendment? Or are they simply agreeing to reduce the density of their own project as part of that? 
We're, we're proposing to modify the text amendment before you to change the base density uh, and to change the maximum density as has been described, and we believe that could be accomplished tonight without a re-advertisement. So you're going to rewrite the, you're basically rewriting the text mm -hmm. amendment, taking it down to 26 dwelling units, or 24, no, 20 base dwelling units per acre, and then offering six credits, which I can barely spat out because we don't have it in front of us at this point. That's correct. C Commissioner Tomlin, just again to clarify, um, and I know this is a point that's come up a lot over the last year. The text amendment process begins with a property owner uh, proposing a, uh, a change to the zoning on their property. Uh, that's the way it's contemplated by the, by the MPC. Once they submit a proposed change to their property, and once they submit it uh, to the board, then it becomes our text amendment. So what would be voted on tonight would be the board, um, we would be making the amendments, because ultimately it's our ordinance, we would be making the amendments to, uh, to the proposed text amendment that's in front of us. Now the applicant uh, has, the, uh, has the option obviously to reject that if they don't want that to be done to their property. But if you want, the, the applicant has indicated a willingness to do it, and if you want to reduce the density down to the maximum of 26, that will be a decision that will be made by the board. Okay. And they're Thanks. consenting to it. If they didn't want to consent to it, they'd say no, and then you'd have to decide what you wanted to do on the original text amendment in front of you. Okay. I also had a, a few other questions I was just hoping to follow up with, if I could. I wanted to change the subject a little bit from zoning to, to traffic, if I may, only because, you know, I know it's more of a conditional use thing, but... Density is a downstream thing, so I just kind of like to ask a few questions. Um, there you go. Yes. Okay, so the um, you're using the ITE uh, land code 252. Can you just explain that a little bit? That's, um, that's senior housing, and I just want to make sure that's not a... That's not a category that's set aside more for um, independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing. It's, it's, it's suitable to a 55 plus development. It, it is, and, and the definition within the ITE trip generation publication uh, indicates senior adult housing uh, consists of independent living developments, including retirement communities, age restricted housing, and active adult housing. Okay. What differentiates that from uh, like you script 220, which is apartments, or um, 223, which is mid-rise apartments in this setting or this application? The difference is there's no age restriction. Um, you know, market rate apartments, anyone can, can live in, in market rate apartments. There are no age restrictions. Um, you could have uh, residents of, of any age demographic. Okay. Okay. Um, a couple other questions too. The, um, along with your project, there's another large project going in very close by. Has that been considered in any of your analysis of this project to date? We got a 400, par 400 car parking garage that's going in very close by. So the initial, the initial traffic study, so if this project continues to move through this process, um, we will have to revise certain elements of this traffic study and resubmit it to the township for review as we move through conditional use and a land development process. Uh, plus, the development is located on two state roads, so we have to go through a PennDOT approval process to obtain a highway occupancy permit, so they'll be interested in, the, in, in looking at the traffic information as well. So it's a long way of saying, no, specifically that development has not been reflected in the analysis, but there's plenty of time through the, the detailed engineering review to incorporate that development into the process. Um, but what I can tell you is, at the end of the day, this site, this proposed development generates less traffic than the site does today. So we can continue to layer additional background growth into the traffic study. All that will do is just further m minimize or dilute any, any impact coming from this project. Um, but yes, all of that can be reflected, and it should be reflected just from a large big picture planning perspective to fully understand how traffic is going to operate in the future. Okay. And then uh, just one more question. We received um, comments from a third party peer reviewer this week, TPD, um, and a couple of things that they had noted. Um, one of them, they had mentioned that you should be providing a 2025 
analysis? Is that something that your team would be willing to provide? I don't necessarily agree that we should have to do that as in, in accordance with PennDOT's policies for traffic impact studies. But if that's important to the township from a, again, for planning purposes, yes, that is something that we can do. Okay. And uh, did you happen to catch the comments about the uh, left turn lane uh, off of westbound Susquehanna Road? Yes. Is that something that your team will be looking into? Well, we can look into it. Again, Susquehanna Road is a state road, and we're going to have to obtain PennDOT approval to make um, uh, to, 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 to build an access along Susquehanna Road. So ultimately, being it's, that it's a state road, PennDOT will have final say as to what that access looks like. I can tell you that our initial traffic study, based on the, the, the volume of traffic generated by the site, it doesn't warrant a left turn lane, so we don't believe it's necessary. We're also not sure that it's feasible, but admittedly, we haven't looked at it closely. So we can look at it, um, but um, our early conclusion is that it's not necessary for the site, nor, nor is it uh, necessarily feasible. Um, but it's something we can look at as we move through the process. And, and we'll work with your traffic engineer as we move through the process. Should we get beyond this step in the process, we'll, we'll work with your traffic engineer and PennDOT on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Spiegelman, then Vice President Klein. Thank you, Mr. President. I actually I had some traffic-related questions, but I, with apologies to Commissioner Thompson, I don't want to get too far away from the, zone, uh, the, the zoning comment. Um, density comment that that related um, Commissioner Vehi and Commissioner Carswell's comments to what Commissioner Klein was saying. Um, just to just to, to clarify, um, and and I guess um, Solicitor Clark, this is actually probably a question for you. Um, I mean, clearly we're talking about changing the zoning ordinance, not just changing this particular plan, but changing the zoning ordinance, the the base and maximum density. I just want to make that Correct. clear. Okay, yeah, because right. I, I, nobody wants to do a dance like this with everybody who comes in. No, no, this, oh. this is the ordinance that is being proposed. This is the ordinance, that, that would be a change that would be for the ordinance, not just for this particular project. Okay. Right. And uh, so, so, uh, so obviously along those lines, and really this is for the benefit of, anyone, of everyone here and everyone watching, um, regardless of how many uh, available additional units, uh, additional units are available through whatever bonuses are left in the final version of the text amendment. Uh, you still can't, it, you, uh, no one coming in under this use would be able to exceed that ceiling of 26. Is that, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Vice President Klein. So I'm going to go back to the zoning ordinance for a second and some really minor issues and just some explanation. <clears throat> so in s section 703, um, H12 use, it talks about the track shall have 300 feet of uninterrupted frontage. Goes on to talk about other things. Um, and then back in under C, um, where it talks about the lot track, it has minimum width 100 feet. <clears throat> Can, I guess, Mr. Kennedy, can you explain why those numbers would be different? There, there are actually two different standards. Um, the, in Section 703, which was, again, one of the things that was requested to be added, that refers to the frontage uh, of the actual property, in other words, the distance along the street line. In, um, in the table, uh, where the lot width is uh, listed at 100, uh, that's the measurement of the lot width at the building setback line. So it's not the frontage. They're two different, uh, two different issues. Um, obviously, so because of odd-shaped lots, you could have a, easily a different frontage and width. So somebody can conceivably have 300 feet of frontage, have an acute angle after the street frontage to get down to 100 feet of lot width for the building setback, is that correct? You, you could. The purpose of the 300 feet was, uh, I, my impression was that uh, it was to further limit the properties that Understood. could qualify for this. Right. But in the same token, I wouldn't, I would, um, considering what I remember of the layout, that having those numbers maybe not necessarily matching but closer 
would be more appropriate than a drastic change that would require, especially since you're only talking about setbacks in one situation of 25 feet and build two right. lines between whatever, 10 and 15 feet, 20, 10 and 25 feet, you would have to have a substantially acute looking frontage, prop, frontage of the property to even get down to 100, square, 100 lineal feet. So I would, uh, <clears throat> then uh, further down in the chart, you have building where it talks about maximum height, minimum separation, maximum length. In the other, in the comment section, it says maximum, as an asterisk, it says maximum front yard setback frontage on Old York Road and Easton Roads shall have a maximum front yard setback. I'm assuming Easton Road should read Susquehanna. That was actually a comment from the county, but um, it, it, <clears throat> well, if there was another property, it would. Um, I, I think what the county had in mind was that along any major road, there should be a, a maximum setback. They don't, they don't want these buildings to be set back 50, 100 feet from the road. Uh, they want to have a limitation because the county is trying to encourage uh, the buildings to be closer to the road. We were pushing things back a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure that Easton Road is not appropriate or whether it should be the, in there at all. Uh, there's only one piece of AO on Easton Road, which is closer to um, when you get into Glenside, and that is nowhere right. near 2,000 feet to a hospital. Um, so I would, you know, in looking at the ordinance, obviously a much more minor thing, I would like to not have the reference to Easton Road. Understood. <coughs> um, under building maximum length, you have 160 feet up to 380 feet with required breaks and offsets under maximum length. And then in the note section, it says maximum building length adjustment. Building facades greater than 160 feet long but less than 300 feet shall have at least one offset. Should those numbers match the 380 and the 300 feet? No, that was done very deliberately. Can you explain that? Uh, sure. It, it, originally, the maximum uh, length was 400 feet, and we were asked to lower it and see if there was a way to break up the facade more. So uh, we, we needed to have something that would trigger uh, the major break, as I'll call it, which is the, the courtyard, and that was determined to be the most efficient way to do it. Uh, the, the, in order to finish that sentence, the, the, these breaks have to take place uh, every 100 feet, um, and then anything in excess of th the 300 foot would have to have the major break being the courtyard. So that was deliberate. Okay. Um, and then I, I dare to move into this arena, because I know we are only talking about a text amendment, but I just did want to bring up one point and it has been a pet peeve of mine about the ITE numbers. Um, am I to understand that the numbers you presented for the existing Y were based on actual data that was obtained at the site? The, the, the peak hour, the, the weekday morning and weekday evening peak hour numbers are based on actual counts at the YMCA driveways. That's 231 for AM, 2, 224 for PM? Yes. Am I, am I also, in reading the charts for ITE, which in this situation would be the four, 495 use group? Is that correct? We okay. used, so we, we, we did. We used the ITE land use code 495, which is Recreational Community Center. Uh, <coughs> we use that for the, um, for the daily trip estimates. We did not count the YMCA driveways over a 24 hour Which is the 1135, period. correct? That, that is the 1135, correct. So if you were to use the actual algorithm for the 495 use group under the ITE, am I to understand, and I don't do this, so I ask you this question as trying to learn also, that the AM peak would be, based on the calculation, would be 58, and the PM peak would be 77, or am I missing something? It's a different formula for the peak hours, so it's n that would not be the 
So uh, do you have the comparison numbers based on the IT? Oh, you know, I, I don't actually. So if you, you, it sounds as though you've researched the ITE data for the land use code 495. I, I don't. I've researched the ITE in my conversations at the, at the County Planning Commission because of other issues, but yes, okay. I have looked at it. So I, ha I do not have the um, formula for land use code 495. So when given the opportunity, <coughs> in, in this case, we have an existing use, a real use, it's an actual use, so when given the opportunity to conduct actual counts of an existing use, that's always superior to estimating the traffic uh, from, from on a, using ITE in that case. And I realize, and I will leave it at this, but I realize that this will come up later on down the road, either through a CU a hearing or a land development, more likely land development, if this, project, if this text amendment were to move forward. Um, I would only ask the question, and I know Mr. Richardson is here from TPD, that we do look at the comparison of the data that you obtained from the Y and the ITE algorithm that would be used for those AM peaks and PM peaks. And the reason I mention that is because I believe, at least based on what I'm looking at, that those numbers, uh, the actual numbers are higher than the algorithm would, put, would spit out. And if that is the case, then my, my um, comment to that would be that we should look at that in comparison to the region because the IT &E numbers are generated by samples throughout the entire country. And some of those samples may not be specific or may not have some, some uh, similarities to the area to the network area that we're talking about at Old York Road in Susquehanna. And, so and I'm yeah. sorry. No, and that, that's a good observation. Certainly we can, we can delve deeper into that if the project moves forward Understood. through the process. And I think what you're discussing, though, really just relates to the existing use, the YMCA use, that, that potential discrepancy between the actual counts and the ITE projections for that YMCA use. As it relates to the, the 180 age-restricted units, um, that is entirely based on ITE. Um, and, and maybe that raises a concern that you have about ITE methodology in general. Well, it, it only I'm, raises concern in what I said, which was if the ITE numbers are lower than the actual counts that you're getting on the YMCA or the recreational use, then there is a thought process that the ITE numbers on the senior housing is lower than the actual will be for this region. Right. Now, that all being said, I do, I do agree that even with any of those changes and those percentages of changes, the reduction in traffic um, would, be, would, would, be, would be actual um, between the recreational, right. recre recreational center and the senior housing. So I know that we're not talking about evening things out. I just want to make sure that when we do get, if we do get to that situation, yes. that that is discussed and thought about. That, that's a great observation. We can have that discussion. <coughs> I think you raise a good point. No matter how it shakes out at the end of the day, I do think we, we feel 100% confident that the proposed age-restricted use will generate significantly less traffic than the existing YMCA. So I think in that point, we agree. I understand your, op your comment. We can agree to delve deeper into that should it move through the process. The only thing I'll offer is our office has conducted counts at other local age-restricted communities in the Delaware Valley area, so it's closer to this region, and we have found that the, the, uh, the data, and, the data holds would, up right. really well. And those would be interesting to me, and I know TPD has done similar, similar things. Unfortunately, I know that PennDOT relies heavily on the IT. They numbers. do, they do. But yeah, so, we can agree to get into that. It should have moved yeah, through the process. All right, I'll leave it at that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from commissioners? If there are none, uh, Mr. Solicitor, could you uh, briefly reiterate before we get into comments from the residents, the difference. Right now is for anyone um, who is uh, uh, seeking party status. And again, understanding what party status means. It means you get to question uh, the applicants. Um, it, uh, you still get to make public comment whether or not you have party status or not. But you get to question the applicants and you get to present uh, testimony if you have any. Um, and testimony does not mean just you making a public comment. It means whether or not you have witnesses or you have other evidence and testimony to present. So if someone is seeking, seeking party status, they should come forward. And if they are within four blocks of the, um, they should give their, their name and their address. And if they're within four blocks of the affected properties, they'll be given party status. If they're not within four blocks, then um, we'll have to ask them for a very brief basis for why they should be granted party status, and then the applicant 
will either um, object to or not object to that person receiving party status. Okay, thank you, Mr. Solicitor. So at this time, I'm gonna open the floor to the public. I just please ask that you be respectful of the meeting process and to the participants here this evening. So at this time, I was handed a sign-in sheet that has about 50 names on it. So I'm hoping that that's not the amount of people that want to speak, but if it is, we'll have to deal with it. So I ask that you be brief. If the person ahead of you has stated something that you wanted to say, I just ask that you ditto his or her comments and not repeat it and move on to something different. Okay? Hold on, please. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, good, good comment, sir. First, uh, as the solicitor brought up, party status first. Anyone that went? Okay, yes, ma'am. Name and address, please. Van Hellersley, I have a presentation, so would it be possible for me to, to do that? Can you give your address, please? Sure, it's 1047 Huntington Road. Could you speak in the microphone, please? Sure. Thank you. Van Hellersley, 1047 Huntington Road. I, I, again, I'm looking at Commissioner Sanchez, who's given me a nod. She, She's clearly within four blocks of clearly. the subject uh, property. She can have party status. She can uh, ask questions of the witnesses, and she can present uh, testimony. Okay. So why, don't we, why don't we see who else wants to mm -hmm. have party status so we know who else before we... Okay. I'm, you said you have a presentation? Yeah, I have, a pre I have some figures that I like to show. Do you want to make a list? Solicitor Clark, do you want to make a list of the people that we... Yeah, I think that's to? probably the better way I'm to sorry. do it first. Your name again? Find, find out who's seeking party status. Your name again, ma'am? Van Hellersleo. Okay. So I think we're going to have the next person who's seeking party status come up. For efficiency, Mr. Clark, could we ask the people to either stand or raise their hand who has party status so we can see right. how many we're talking but about? Because it, we're it, not going to object to anybody within the four blocks. Okay. So, again, we'll start over here. Can you state your name and your address, please? And she's within four blocks. <coughs> He's within four blocks. Herb McMahon, 1046 Huntington Road. Also within four, four blocks. Yep. Heidi Kleiman, 1785 Brook Road. Yep, all within four blocks. Stephen Lee, 1073 Huntington okay. Road. And, and again, I just want to be clear. All of you are planning on questioning the witnesses, not just making public comment. You're planning on questioning the witnesses or presenting testimony. Testimony doesn't mean that you're just going to get up and speak. That means you're presenting witnesses or you're presenting some sort of evidence. Is that what, is, is that what everyone is intending to do, who's seeking party status? And it protects our right to ask. No, no, it does, it, it, uh, so you're planning on questioning the applicant's witnesses, not just making a comment? Yes. Okay. I would like to do, I would like to do both. I'll do the party status and then at the end, I'll sit back down and make a comment. Okay, we'll, we'll, we can rule on that at, at the time. So, uh, also over here. Um, my name is David Betts, 1903 Briarcliff Avenue. I'm within four blocks of our uh, Meadowbrook Apartments. Okay. On the other side. Tennessee's 1443 Woodland Road. I'm with, not within four blocks. Okay. You're not within four blocks. Okay. You want to, I have one question. Mr. Gunlock, do you want to uh, object or do you want to hear the basis from this? Well, it sounds like she's just with, has a question. So I think that we're okay, okay with the people outside of four blocks not having to go through the party status. We'll still allow the questions okay. to anybody outside of right. four blocks. There's two and <laughs> three in the back, four. Within the four blocks, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm Kat Gibbons and I'm on the Attenton Township Environmental Advisory Council and one of the witnesses had presented a letter in response to our letter that we presented and would like to question the response. Okay. Uh, are, do, are you, do you live within four blocks of the subject property? I have a other reason that because actually it was a response and it wasn't, there was some things that we'd like you're, to say. You're part of an advisory board within the township. 
Mr. Gunlock, do you have any objection? No objection. Thank you. Gentleman in the back. Okay. Anyone else? The lady in the back standing? Yes. Uh, public comment is you're, you have the opportunity to question the applicant's witnesses. <laughs> public comment is just your opportunity to make public comment. The commissioners don't necessarily have to respond to your questions. Well then, no. It, no, the questioning is of the applicant's witnesses. Public, you can ask the, the commissioners all the questions you'd like during public comment. Okay, do I think there was one more hand. Yes. Laura Lane, 1431 Bryant Lane, and I am within four blocks of uh, the project. She's not. Uh, she's not. Mr. Gonlock, you have any objection? And she's located where? 1431 Bryant Lane. And approximately how far is that from the subject property? Well, that is, that is uh, no, but is it near Holy Redemption? Again, I'm just not understanding. Is she within four blocks of the property that's proposed to be rezoned as part of these proceedings? No. Then I would object to, okay. to her. As of currently right now, if the if the the person seeking party status is not within four blocks, uh, Mr. Gunlock has a, a right to object, which I think he is, and I think it would be appropriate to deny this individual party status. Okay, let's move on then. Okay, uh, ma'am, would you start then? <clears throat> so I am allowed to have a PowerPoint presentation. I just wanted to clarify you know how that long, before. How long is it? Is it? Um, it's four slides. All right, do you plan on asking the applicant any yes, questions? Yes, I do. Okay, so why don't you start with that? So as a party status, she has unlimited time, right? No, not necessarily. It has to be, it has to be relevant. We have a, the right to cut her off at any time if it becomes repetitious, yeah, not relevant. Provided she stays on track. Yeah. Stays on point, right. <coughs> and, and again, I, I don't mean to beat this to, to death, but <coughs> getting up in party status does not mean you can simply get up and make statements in the form of, of, of questions. They have to be questions regarding the, the text amendment to the applicant. While we're waiting for the um, technical apparatus to be straightened out, uh, would it be a recommendation by anyone to take a uh, five minute break right now? Yes. Good idea, okay. Uh, Nathan, we're gonna take a five minute break. That's it, great, thank you so much. Which one? Um, this one's mine, thank you. and then this one's mine next. Thank you for your patience. There was criticism, pro and con, for taking a break, but I think it was needed. Mm -hmm. We had to take care of some, <laughs> a lot of issues. Uh, at this time, before you start, ma'am, I'd just like to turn it over to our solicitor who's gonna make a brief statement for everyone in attendance this evening. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you, President Luker. Uh, after a consultation uh, with uh, President Luker and Vice President Klein, uh, the board is going to be recessing uh, this meeting at 11 o'clock uh, tonight. Um, so what that means is we will have to find another date. We're not going to be recessing this to a date certain, so there'll be another advertisement for this. Um, and that will allow everyone who wants to speak, everyone who has asked for party status, the opportunity to come back at that recessed hearing and to uh, present and to make public comment. It will also give us the opportunity to work on a... Uh, a more updated version of the uh, of the ordinance uh, based on uh, some of the representations made by the uh, applicant this evening. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Okay. Yours. 
Again, my name is Dr. Van Hellerslea. I live on 1047 Huntington Road. Um, commissioners, as part of your oath when assuming office of Board I'm of going to object at this point. She has party status. The right. role at this point is to question the witnesses, not to make a statement. If she wants to make a statement, that would come during public comment at the end of the proceedings. And that would be appropriate. So I okay. have um, Thank you. data, uh, evidence on uh, my uh, questioning. Uh, because there's, in order for me to ask him this question, I want to be able to provide adequate background. No, you can ask questions or you can present evidence. Making, okay. making statements is not appropriate. So evidence such as um, providing statistics, is that, is that you, you, uh, you indicated that you have a PowerPoint that yeah. has statistics. Yeah. You can present that Okay. Now. Fair. <coughs> okay. Um, so this is the area um, that is in effect. Uh, this is a, a 0.5 square uh, mile area, uh, and um, uh, according to the Montgomery County statistics, the projected growth for Abingdon Township from 2010 to 2040 is 2 percent. Um, according to a uh, report, um, this was published in the 2016 Abingdon School District report on housing units, um, showing uh, exponential growth in the number of housing units. Um, this does not include uh, uh, data since this time. This was uh, published with data start, uh, ending in 2015. So since then, we have uh, Lionsgate in 2017 and the upcoming development of Rydal Waters and Betawood Apartments, which will have added another 522 <coughs> housing units. So if I were to chart this data with this new data, uh, it would essentially be off the screen, right? Because it translates to an absolute increase in the population by at least 800 people within this 0.5 square mile area. The approval of this proposal will add another 180 units, and I guess at this point it might be a little bit less, I don't know. Collectively, all of these units uh, will allow for an increase of at least 1,000 additional people into our 0.5 square mile area. Using U.S. Census Bureau data, our population density will increase by 55 percent within this 0.5 square mile area. We are clearly exceeding that of Cheltenham Township and approaching that of the municipality of Norristown. Where is that going to head us? I think that's, that's, that's the subject for tonight. So my question then uh, is, um, you know, with the uh, development of Baderwood uh, and Rydal Waters, um, uh, both uh, upscale uh, living facilities, Baderwood being um, available for all ages, not age restricted, um, and providing upscale amenities, um, what uh, unmet need does this project uh, add uh, that would therefore exceed uh, our population density and, and already be provided by Baderwood? Is that a question yes. that you're asking? Yes. Uh, Mr. Markman, could you please explain uh, or answer the question as to what need this project would fill? Uh, that's uh, uniquely uh, different than some of the projects that they're ref that uh, doctors referencing. So, a as I mentioned in many of the meetings, and I actually offered to take any of the residents or anybody else to the Dublin Terrace apartments. These are independent senior living apartments. So basically, we don't provide services. We have some activities that they can participate in, um, but you don't have to pay a fee to get in. Um, I can tell you, Rider Waters, I, I don't know what it is, but you have to buy into it and then pay a monthly fee. And it's a great thing. I mean, Rydal Park is a great thing. And it provides medical services and other services. We don't provide that. And as a result, we're much, much less expensive. We're about $2,000 a month. There's some number there or in excess of that. Plus, there's a buy-in fee that's anywhere from $300,000 or up, is my understanding. But it's, it, even if it's not, it's a significant fee. There's no buy-in for us. So it's basically independent living where seniors can live together. And I can tell you it's created a tremendous lifestyle for a lot of seniors at Dublin Terrace. My wife teaches yoga and aerobics there, and I can tell you it's dramatically changed a lot of people's lives to live in this kind of environment. My in-laws moved out of their house recently and moved into the plaza. It's an older apartment complex. It doesn't offer any of the amenities that we would offer. It's, it's just not, not the same thing. As far as the, so that's compared to Rydal Park. Compared to the market rate apartments, which Brandolini is proposing, and I've looked at that, and, and there's merit to it because it's more like transit-oriented apartments. Um, 
there's a serpentine driveway to get up to it. It's, it's not something that necessarily is appropriate for all seniors. If seniors want to live in an environment that has younger people and older people, it's probably appropriate. This creates an environment where older people can get together, they can socialize, they can enjoy themselves. And once again, if you go to Dublin Terrace, and I invite anyone to come to Dublin Terrace and see, we just had our Christmas party there. We had 150 people, our holiday party, at the holiday party, which is unheard of for an apartment complex. So it's an enriching social environment that doesn't have the buy-in. That's not something that's being offered by Brandolini either. It's not a senior community. Um, how do you determine viability when you don't know what materials you're going to use yet? I think we had this question already answered, um, if I'm not mistaken, Council. Uh, yeah, the, 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 that's not part of what the text amendment is. Right. That would be part of the conditional use hearing or the, uh, or the land development, and I'm not sure what you're doing. Well, I guess the well, I guess the um, the comment that was made about how low he can go, and he said that as low as he can go would be a maximum of 26. My question is, how do you determine 26 if you don't know what materials you're going to be using? I think we answered that the materials would be in compliance uh, with the uh, codes of the township. It has not yet been designed, and it will be fully designed mm -hmm. as this process proceeds if the board was to adopt the ordinance. So I guess my question becomes, if you have not fully designed your project, um, how can you tell ahead of time that 26 is as low as you can go? You don't need to design the entire project to run a cost feasibility analysis. Um, the applicant has constructed enough of these projects to understand the costs that are involved and has done that preliminary work, but has not engaged an architect to drill down on the specific and detailed plans, uh, which will cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to do. So that, are you saying that if a project is, um, if this doesn't pass, and we're saying that it must be no more than 24, this is not going to be a viable project, is that right? The numbers speak for themselves. Okay. To the speaker, how many more questions? Is that it? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next speaker, please. Next up is Christine. Christine. Your name, please. Heidi Kleiman, 1785 Brook hold, Road. Hold on a second. The next person on the list, I think, was Christine. Oh, we're going in order. Oh, you take I apologize. Uh, Christine Darderis, 1065 Huntington Road. Um, I had a question about the pocket, pocket park that is proposed. Um, who is going to be responsible for maintaining that? Is there a division between the park and the development if it goes forward? We would be responsible for maintaining it. It would be part of our landscape contract that we would have with our landscaper. And yes, there would be a division, there would be a fence, it wouldn't be readily accessible by our residents. They would have to walk to it. So it's not something, it's really for the neighbor, your neighborhood, it's really not for our residents. Um, I guess my concern is the access from the busy roads, like the bus stops that are close by, and um, the potential for crime, um, people using buses to get into the area cutting through your parking lot and getting to our street? Is there, is there gonna be access to our street through the park? No, I mean, I mean, you're saying the park on your street, the pocket park? Right, um, looking at the uh, drawings, it looks like you can cut through the parking lot to get into the pocket park. Um, it's gonna be fenced, there's not gonna be an opening. And, and as far as the pocket park, we're open to whatever design the neighbors want. If they just want it to be a landscaped area, it'll be a landscaped area. We're, if you don't want benches, you don't want, you know, it can be just look like, you know, kind of a wooded, pretty landscaped area. We're, we're open to any, and, and frankly, I've said that before, and nobody seems to want to discuss what goes there, but I'm open to whatever anybody on that street wants to discuss. We can form a committee, and you can tell me what you want to do there. Okay, and uh, what kind of security would be involved with your facility? Um, we would have a, I mean, we basically usually have um, staff there all day long. We have people on call at night, and then to get into the property, you have a, it's a key fob system. Would there be people, be people patrolling your parking lot and 
Um, our parking lot would actually be closed. You would need a key fob to be able to get into it. So no, there, there wouldn't be any individual security guards at night, no. No. We generally have a maintenance person living there that just kind of responds to the residents' need, but we haven't found that we needed security on any of our properties. Are you saying to get onto the property, you have to have a key fob? No, to get into the parking garage, you would need the, okay. yeah, a key fob. Um, just from the pictures, it looked like there was parking outside as There well. is some parking outside, but to get, and we have the Dublin Terrace Apartments, to get into the underground parking, you need a key fob. Mm -hmm. If you just park in the lot, you would park in the lot like you would at any other apartment or condominium, similar to the, the ones on the fairway, Rydal Park, mm -hmm. everything else. And would there be cameras installed to like... Possibly. I mean, we haven't determined that yet. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. We've had some very serious crime on our street, so that's why I'm asking. Okay. okay. Break-ins through people's windows while people were home at night. Um, another question was, would be um, willing to put sidewalks in on Huntington Road? The entire stretch does not have sidewalks. You know, I know one of the suggestions made, and, and sidewalks, we, we would be willing to, one of the suggestions made was a sidewalk from our property down to Huntington Road, um, which we would be willing to do, but that would be up to the Germains if they would want that. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the whole Huntington Road, I think we're, we're actually investing in sidewalk money around the whole corner of the cemetery, so we're going to redo all those sidewalks and repair all the fences there, so that's kind of we're kind of, the focus is not to bring people on to Huntington Road, it's really to have people walk up and down Old York Road and potentially shop, go to the synagogue, go to their doctor's office, they have to go to the hospital, township building, things like that. My concern for the sidewalks is because people are gonna use our street as a cut through no matter what anyone says here tonight. Mm -hmm. so, so the one thing we've proposed and we've said, if, if the majority of the people on Huntington Road would want it to be, we would be willing to put a cul-de-sac on the end. Um, or traffic calming measures, if you want the speed bumps. These are all things that we're willing to do. I, I would like you to do that. Okay, well, <laughs> if, I, if you can get your neighbors to tell me you want to do it, I'll make it into a cul-de-sac. Well, I mean, obviously we would all have to discuss yeah. it and yeah, figure it, it out. Yeah, that's something that's got to be the majority of the people on the street, obviously. Um, my other question is, I know um, there's been view shed views from property, from a property perspective, and it was from, I believe, the end of our street looking up, and my house is directly across the street, and I'm just having a hard time understanding how a four-story building closer to my house is going to be shorter than a two-story building further away from my house. Um, the view shed di diagrams that we showed were, it was from the neighbor to the south of the property, so, so it wasn't, like, it wasn't the Germains, um, like, directly to the east, it was to the south. You need to link up, please. Sorry. Um, I, I was saying that the view shed diagram that we showed was from the neighbor's property directly to the south, and in, in that situation, the, Abington, the existing Abington YMCA is currently sitting uh, pretty much directly on the property line um, at that particular corner um, or corner of the building. Um, so where the Abington YMCA is sitting on the property line there, um, we were pushing our building back, uh, be it 70 feet, 100 feet off the property line. So the, the view shed was uh, increasing. Um, as far as, sorry, do you, do you live directly east of the property? I do live directly across the street from the proposed pocket park, the former Shotwell residence. Okay. Um, I could, like, I, I haven't studied it. I haven't, I haven't, uh, I, could, I guess I, I could draw I would, a similar diagram to see what it would I look would like, like to see in reality um, what it might look like from an expert's point of view, because I can't afford to hire someone right. to do it for me. So we did, um, some, some of those views, uh, some of the, the photos with the, uh, the building kind of imposed into them, um, not the diagrams, like the actual photos that had the building in it. Like those, those might be more relevant to, to your view from. Yeah, I guess uh, like, if, you know, if we have to come around again, if you could maybe show that, that would be awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have my any other more question questions, ma'am? Is do you own any of the properties that are listed right now that are involved in this development? Um, we currently are equitable owner. We have them under agreement of, of sale. So. Um, I thought you had to be a property owner. Didn't you say that? to request these. They're the equitable owner. Oh, so they're at that is legally an owner. Yep. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Roy. My name is Roy Gibson, 1079 Huntington Road. I live directly east of the project. Um, my house sits below. 
Um, my question, actually, I appreciate the segue Christine gave me, but I understand you have equitable um, agreements with property owners on our street. Are there any that are not listed in this right now that are on the table? Are there any agreements out there for a portion of property or any no. other properties on Huntington Road? So there's no other agreements out there? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. McMahon. Herb McMahon, 1046 Huntington Road. I wanted to ask the question, how big is the property? Because when we started, I believe it was 4.64, and now when uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Spiegelman was uh, asking you a question earlier, you said 5.6 acres. How, how big is it? 5.6 gross acres. Okay, so how did it go from 4.6 to 5.6? I'm not sure why anybody would ever say 4.6. Oh, it was never 4.64? Okay. Uh, all right, and then um, I um, wanted to ask the question, Sunrise is right across the street and it's AO. If it was ever sold, could it apply for H12 if it was approved? I don't know how, how large that lot is. So it's conceivable that there's other AO properties out there other than what you're saying that this could be? I believe we already answered that question. Uh, the only other um, available properties would be? Well, you're saying available. I'm asking for any, any property because this Sunrise could be sold. Anything can be sold. And I think there's more than just one other property that could. Well, I believe they, they also only have uh, frontage on Susquehanna, correct? So there's a requirement that, that there be frontage on two roads. Okay. So, so I guess it's Eckert. So, so Sunrise on its own could not be developed in this fashion. Okay, because there's Eckert Road that falls behind it. Uh, there's Huntington Road that falls yeah. on the side. And yeah, we, we would honestly have to look at it because I'm not sure what the acreage is. Most typical Sunrise developments are fairly small. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, Mr. McMahon, okay. Can, you, get can you to make my it, next question? Can you keep it moving so sure. others? I, I don't think I'm taking too long. I thought it was a reasonable question. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask the the question. Uh, Commissioner Carswell brought up the fact that you know you're you're going to write something, uh, and it's going to be for 55 plus, and it will go into perpetuity. I think isn't it reasonable to say that that's worth the paper it's printed on? Uh, things can change. I'm, I'm looking at how the 2017 zoning uh, ordinance is treated. It's only a year old and we're ch potentially changing it. So it could potentially. No, the answer is no. The ordinance clearly says that the unit shall be age restricted in compliance with the Federal Fair Housing Act. <coughs> Federal Fair Housing Act references age restricted housing and that's what we're providing here. In addition, I said uh, to the ordinance provision, we would, as most solicitors request, an applicant to put a separate deed restriction against the land as part of the development documentation, and we would do that as well. Okay, because I also understood you to say that the definition of that, um, what did you uh, just say, uh, it was referred to as? The Federal Fair Housing Act. Yeah, you didn't know the definition of what that age was, right? I know the, defini the what, definition, it's 55. Okay. Yeah. Because it was like one of these unclear. No, it's crystal clear. It's 55 okay. and over, yes. Okay. And so the Germain's house, the Lippa's house, the Ezrick's house, and the Taylor house, there's no, there's no uh, land being taken from them. That's the prior gentleman asked. There's no okay. other agreements, and there's a limitation, as Mr. Kennedy referenced in the ordinance, to only one uh, house that was used as a single family home. Okay. And the Shotwell house, the Shotwell house, can we keep that as residential? Because I don't think the community has ever asked for a park, pocket park. They've never asked for the house to be demolished. And I think our wish as a community would be that it would remain mm -hmm. residential. Mm -hmm. It's our proposal to incorporate, demolish that and incorporate it into this project. So is that no? It, it, we can't keep it residential? Uh, 
our proposal is to incorporate into the project. All right, so that's a no. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Heidi Kleiman. Good evening. This will be really quick. Um, I had a question for Mr. Markman, and I also had slides of our views from the three homes that will be impacted, and I would like to present that now, if that's okay. They are right here. I just need to have the presentation opened. Um, Mr. Markman, I was very um, interested in the density. Oops, sorry. Absolutely. I was interested in the density. Can you come to the microphone, please, Ms. Kleiman? Ashley, thank you for your assistance here. You provided density comparables, and I Could was Could you speak interested. to the mic, please? Sorry. Uh, you provided density comparables, and I was very interested in being informed on the building trends. Um, when I looked at a lot of those properties, many were infill for undesired or abandoned parcels, or the zoning was coming from commercial or manufacturing. So I would be very interested in getting equivalent comparisons from that density document that were similar to our property. Would that be possible? Um, no, I, I don't have that information. Montgomery County Planning Commission compiled it. The, the only thing I would mention is that this clearly is an infill site. This, well, this has a use and the use is leaving. It's either going to be developed as senior housing which would have less impact, or another option is if it was vacant and became derelict. I understand. Um, in reading uh, information on infill, there are various definitions. Primarily, they have to do with urban areas and areas that are um, difficult to build upon for op different obstacles. Now, you may have a different view of infill, but I just want my whole purpose in asking is I really want equivalent comparisons because I would like to look up those properties and I would like to compare the density, the design with what they're producing with what's recommended here. In, infill simply has to do with whether a site is developed around it. I live in Harleysville in Lower Salford Township. We have infill sites. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the renderings that Mr. Markman has produced, uh, the one that shows from the bottom of our hill is the most remo remote spot on Huntington Road to view his property. And we are asking that Mr. Markman produce some renderings for us that would give us a good understanding of what will be behind the three properties on Huntington Road closest to Old York Road. So I just took a photo this afternoon, it was really quick, of the property that is being built on the corner of Davisville and Old York Road, and I just opposed it, so I um, apologize to my neighbors if it is underrepresentative or Mr. Markman if it is overrepresentative of what they will see in the backyard, but it would be very helpful if we could have those renderings. This is 1046. 1052, uh, also 1052, the properties there uh, all have elevated land behind them, and 1056, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Lee. Hi, uh, Mr. Markman, you mentioned um, Dublin Terrace. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me how many acres that is on? Um, I think it's about 18 acres. Okay, so the density there is much less than Yeah, it's a different proposing. density, absolutely. Okay, so we need to know that when we're comparing. Well, the reason I'm comparing it is the type of community, so. I understand. Uh, and, and I can tell you that the, the irony of that place is that a lot of the residents actually drive to the clubhouse um, because they don't want to walk, but. It's, it's the type of environment that gets creative. And Dublin Terrace, 50% of the residents are either from Upper Dublin or have children in Upper Dublin. So it's keeping them having a nice place to live. And that's really what we're doing here. So the idea is to keep Abington residents in Abington so they don't have to move to places like Upper Dublin after they get older and want to get out of their house. So. Okay. But you were able to build a, 
with a much lower density and you're still making it's, money. It's not, the, the density wasn't the comparable point. It's the type of community for older people that does not exist currently in Abington. That was my point. Okay. Um, could you tell me what the, what's the necessity of uh, disturbing the steep slopes? Why can't they be kept undisturbed? Uh, that is part of the... Uh, You don't know why that's in the amendment? It says that 50% of the steep slopes could be disturbed. I'm not so sure. Are there steep slopes in this application? Or maybe that was an older version. I apologize if this is an error. Right. Um, Right. I don't think that's in this. It is in this one. Yeah. It is in it. Yeah. This one has a provision regarding redevelopment in paragraph 9, which contained man made steep slopes. Thank you, slopes. Commissioner Carswell. Yes. It's in there. Thank you. I believe, would that be the back, the back of the, uh, the property between? where the fence is on the YMCA and the property uh, 1052 Huntington Road. I think that is what's defined as a steep slope. So the, you put in there that um, you want to change that. And I'm just asking you why that needs to be changed or disturbed. Okay. Um, I think my last question has sort of been asked, but um, if 1052 Huntington Road is going to be modified, wouldn't it be required that sidewalks be put in since sidewalks are standard nowadays on Huntington Road? But that may be a question for the board. It's, it's my understanding that the sidewalk stops just short of 1052 right now, is that? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, we could extend it through 1052. Uh, the, on, the only tricky part is once you get to the Germain's property, there's there's a, a slope on their property, and you would really have to like take some of their property to really extend it all the way to the corner. Right. I mean, that's something we would certainly be willing to do if, if okay. they. But well, when you did your impervious um, calculation, there was nothing. That amount of impervious was not included. I'd have to. So that wouldn't count wouldn't towards count. the. Okay, but we could extend the side. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I think we would extend the sidewalk through that property. Okay, yeah. since Lionsgate was built, there is uh, a lot more pedestrian traffic on Huntington Road, yeah. and they have to walk in the middle of the street once they pass uh, yeah, the to next. Walk up there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, David on Briar Cliff Road. Uh, my name is David Betts, 1903 Barcliff Avenue. Uh, just some questions to the developer. Have you provided any preliminary design and uh, information to the commissioners and to the township as to what can be done on the adjoined property that you have using existing zoning ordinance? No. You have not. And that way you have not done any calculations on the tax revenues to the township if the property was developed using existing ordinance. Yeah. Do you feel it's reasonable for these people to make an educated decision when they don't have a comparison between the existing ordinance and what you guys are asking for? Don't you think it's very important for us to know what can be under existing? Could you speak to the microphone? What you're doing. No, My no. point is, right. I think it's rather important right. for you to know what existing, and for us to know what existing conditions provide, what the tax revenue would be provided versus what they're asking for. I would not be able to make a decision without that information. Right, the way your head was turned, we couldn't hear what you were saying. Very well. Okay, thank you. So that has not been done at this point. Do you think that should be done? I think we've already answered that. We haven't done it. We don't believe it should be done. Very we well. are here on a text amendment and proposing a project based under a proposed uh, rezoning with an ordinance amendment. Correct. So the text amendment is irrelevant as to what is existing, and that is irrelevant in your opinion. Um, 
Um, I don't know if I agree with that, but is it your job to educate the public and the commissioners as to, um, you know, the project you're proposing and the zoning? I mean, have you, that's your job basically to educate us as to what you're going to do. Is that correct? And they are supposed to also sell us on this idea that it is beneficial. Is that also correct? That, that's not correct. We're, we're here to present a proposed text amendment and a rezoning, and this board has the right to adopt it or to reject it. Okay. Um, but they are supposed to vote on our desires as taxpaying citizens of Abington. So that it would be rather important for us to have a good idea so that we can communicate to you as to what is really being proposed and what are the changes here. Do you have any more questions yeah. at the upper? Okay, yeah, right. okay. Um, EDUs. Um, how many EDUs will your building use? I mean, there's a current moratorium in Cheltenham. Been there, what, five years? No, cons no construction, no development because there's no EDUs. We had one in Abington because there were not EDUs available. Is this Think again, he's making an argument here. No, the question is, right. is, how is this going to affect future development in Abington? I, I can address the sewer connection issue. That is, that is uh, an item in the process of land development that would have to be addressed. There are certain sewer connections that are allocated to this property already mm -hmm. under its current use. That would be evaluated. And the amount of sewage that would be projected from this proposed use based upon a final density would be evaluated. And a determination would need to be made whether additional connections would need to be purchased. And if they would need to be purchased, we would make an application for those connections. And this project could not proceed forward without those sewer connections. Next, next question. Um, as far as um, they wanted um, a documentation, I didn't know that was needed tonight, but on abingtoncitizens.com, uh, they've collected 190 signatures saying that this project is Again, undesirable. Again, I reject, Mr. President. He's Thank just you. making argument, which is fine during public comment. No, but you said if I had brought the documents, I already know you have okay. them. I'm just bringing it to everybody else's right. attention. An opportunity to ask questions. Thank yeah. you, sir. You have a question? Um, one other. Um, the architecture has been dummied down from what was shown in January versus where we are today. How did that happen and why? I mean, it was shown as a high-end building with high-end finishes, uh, no monolithic slabs, and today what's being shown, you know, it has nothing to do with the text amendment, but it does. So uh, initially we had proposed a, a brick building with a different design that, that wasn't well received, um, and then we proposed like alternate imagery um, which we thought was uh, better received, and, and that's when we changed the design to get to where we are today. Mm -hmm. We didn't try to dumb it down, as you say. We, we just changed the design um, to fit more with the context, added the slope roofs, changed some of the materials. <coughs> so this okay. is still an architecturally significant building that you're showing, or thinking about, even though you don't yeah, know we, what you're we, gonna build. Uh, we like it more now than we did when we, uh, we, we like the new design more than the initial design. I see. Okay, next question. That's it. Okay, thank you. Julie Mancini. Julie Mancini. Hello, is that good? Speak, um, speak into the mic and speak up, please. Okay, uh, Julie Mancini, I live at 1937 Adams Avenue, so I am across Old York Road opposite to where this <coughs> complex will be. And my question is, uh, first question is really related to how the information is being presented. And I feel like the, w the way that the information is being presented is trying to get the residents to get on board with this so you have less conflict and to get the commissioners to completely understand in an honest format what is being presented. So what I see in the documentation is the property is referred to as I think an H-12 senior property. Um, but then in some of the documentation, it's referred to as age restriction uh, 55. And when I read that, I see, oh, only one person has to be 55 and as long as there's no school age uh, children. Um, in the property, then that is sufficient and meets the requirement. And then I hear some of the dialogue is drawing comparison to Rydal Park, which is no comparison to what is being requested for this property that's a continuing care retirement community. So that's really no comparison at all to... Do you have a question? Person, but, so right. my question really is 
the H-12 designation, is there something that's dictating that to be called senior housing as, to, as opposed to 55 restriction? Um, and why is uh, the parallel being drawn in the dialogue in what's being presented here to a retirement community? Because to me as a resident that lives nearby, <laughs> It just seems like it's, it's, it's not being clearly presented to get the resident support and the commissioners to really understand what they're voting on. Well, that let this, me, this let is me answer a, that to make it. This is it, a community like uh, myself. Okay, let me answer that. The, all okay. the residents in here, the restriction on each unit is 55 and over and no school aged children. Mm -hmm. Could one spouse be 57 and another spouse be 54? Yes, that's permissible under the Fair Housing Act. That I understand. So in the documentation in the text, I guess it's the amendment that I've been looking at, it refers to the change as senior housing, which 55 is not senior housing. And I don't know if that's being done because that's what H-12 is, or it's it's kind of being done to deceive, as, well as, as well as referring no, to this as a CCRC. Nobody's deceiving anybody. It's senior housing. It's 55 and over. The Federal Fair Housing Act specifies that as the age, um, and that's what we're going with. Well, and I do understand the Federal Fair Housing Act. So why isn't it in the documentation referred to as an H-12 age-restricted community? That's the title that we use for it. It's age-restricted housing. It's in there. Uh, that's what it is. But it's not senior. And it's certainly not Rydal sure. Park, which was brought up it's several times. It's not Rydal Park. Rydal Park's a different project. Some of the residents brought Rydal Park up. This is a four-rent apartment complex. I understand You do not that. need to pay a fee to get admitted into it. That's the difference. I understand that. Then the traffic, so getting to the traffic now, okay. that should not be compared to anything that Rydal Waters or Rydal Park would generate. So my question is now in terms uh, along the same lines uh, with the traffic study that was done. And I think, Michael Thompson, you had asked a lot of questions that would be similar to what I was thinking about the traffic and how was that study done. I'm going to... Uh, okay, so I want to know in terms of the traffic. When the traffic study was done, which seems faulty to me, frankly. Again, um, you got to ask questions. The You're question, making commentating. So Here's the our question, traffic engineer. Ask so my whatever question you want. around the traffic study is when the traffic study was done, was it done exactly on a property that is the age restriction? that is this property is going to be, which is 55 or above, and basically one person over 55 in that community. And the size that this community is gonna be. And uh, where okay, can you have I to find let that information? Ask, you have to let him answer And then I just the wanna question. know where I can find that information. Okay, let's, let's so, let him answer. So the, the, the trip estimates that we used in the traffic study are based on the ITE land use code 252 under the title of senior adult housing. And under the definition, so, so this is, this, our traffic projections are based on actual studies of other similar type communities. And ITE <coughs> defines senior adult housing as uh, a community that would include independent living developments, retirement communities, age restricted housing, and active adult communities. So ITE defines this use uh, senior adult housing as covering multiple housing types of which age restricted housing is one of those types. Um, and, and, and none of the none of the housing types that are included under this description are assisted living or uh, memory care or uh, the, the types of uh, residential developments where you have much older residents or residents that um, are seeking medical attention and um, are not able to uh, perhaps be as uh, mobile. So was there a traffic study done that only looked at age-restricted 55? So our office has conducted counts at only age 55 and up type communities 
And we have found that those, based on those counts and those studies, and this is part of the conversation that we, uh, we had earlier this, this evening, uh, the, the traffic numbers are similar to the numbers that are used uh, by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Um, we, as traffic engineers, are obligated to follow certain rules in conducting our traffic studies. Uh, the township requires that, PennDOT requires that, one, and one of those rules is that we have to use the ITE data for estimating traffic. So we have done that. I'm very comfortable with the land use. Uh, the traffic estimates that we're getting from ITE, I believe, are absolutely appropriate for this type of land use. Uh, although it is an age 55 and up community, uh, most planners will tell you the demographics are that the average age is above 55. Um, it is senior housing, and, and this is the land use that we've assumed, and it is appropriate. So uh, I would like to know if there's any way to find the study that would compare your ITE study with studies that were done, only 55. I mean, I, I essentially would be the target audience of this. My husband and I are 55. We have someone else living in the home who's younger. We have four cars. We make 12 trips in and out a day. It doesn't seem to align with your numbers, which your numbers mm -hmm. might be um, rounding out because it includes some of the more senior centers. So is it possible to get that information on how your study would compare you're with that? Your yeah, I mean, we, we, we have additional information. If the project moves continue, continues to move through the process, as was discussed earlier this evening, we can make that information available. Okay. I think we've I think we've uh, covered that area enough. Okay. Any other one last question? I think that was right? it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kaki Evans. Um, good evening. Um, I have seven questions, and I'm sure. How that many? Seven. I have seven questions. They're pretty brief. But what I'm suggesting is, can we assume that there won't be a vote taken tonight? And I'd gladly submit them by that's email. Not, that's not one of the, that's six. All right, nine, all right. Nine, so nine, I should just, I'm six. trying to, in the interest of time, are, I could we're email. Going to, we're going to recess at 11 o'clock. We're going to reconvene at 11 Okay. No all right, so what I'm going to do in the interest of time is I will email questions, okay? Thank and you. Wait then. Thank you. Thank you. Diane Marsh. Diane Marsh. Um, I'll withhold that for public comment. Thank you. I believe that. I believe that's the end of our list of those who identified themselves as party status. Is there anybody else that we missed? Um, I'm sorry. We, that gentleman back there. This gentleman, right. Yes, come forward. <laughs> you sir. did. I didn't get your name. I apologize. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Joe Rosak. I live at 1927 Susquehanna Road, and I have a lot of knowledge about Susquehanna Road. And your question? What, I'm going to come there. Okay. I have to give you who I am so you know where my questions are coming from. I'm a retired teacher, and I believe a lot in process and data. I'm a science teacher. My first question is for the transportation engineer. The data that you collected at the Y, did you actually count the cars? Yes. Okay, you did there. You did, that's why I want to make sure you did, because you put that data up there, then you had estimated data next to it, saying that's real data. The, the, actual, but, the, the, yeah. the peak hour data okay. numbers are based on actual counts. Okay, actual counts of the cars yes. coming in there. Because that's very important for me because knowing what the data is and how we interpret it. Okay, um, now my questions are for Mr. Martin. Okay, um, you, know, you know the zoning code, right? Yes. Okay, when you put in the bid for this property, did you know what the zoning code was? Yes. You did? Okay. So you're an enterprising developer and you saw a nice piece of land, which is very good, and it could be developed. Then your next step, did you talk to the owner of the, uh, the funeral home, what his interest would be? Or did he go to you? He came to me. He came to you. How did he know you were interested? I don't know. It just party talk? I mean, I, oh, hey, by the way, one of, yeah, I don't believe that. All right, now, so what I'm getting at is this. You know what the zoning is. If I know what the zoning is on my property, I will not go forward. Uh, objection, no, Mr. Gonna, President. This is, he's making okay. an argument which no. is fine during public comment. I'm asking comment, my question now. Please let me finish my question. No, no, excuse me, sir. The, the attorney questioned your question. Yeah. 
Okay. I, I just I, think he's making argument here, which is fine for public comment, but if he wants to ask a question, right. we're, we're, we love to answer a question. He answered Thank my you. questions. Yes. So, so what's next your question, next question, sir? My next question following that, what is to stop any other developer to come in and ask to change the zoning code? I don't think that's an appropriate well, question. I don't do think that question could be answered by, by this developer. But he thought he could do it, right? Yeah. Nothing. No, There's nothing not necessary. Go ahead. You have another question, sir? Yeah, I have a myriad of questions. Well. All right. Now, another one about the sidewalk alongside the cemetery. How wide are you going to make that? <coughs> we, we don't own the we don't own the cemetery or the sidewalk next to the cemetery we can improve it like right now the the sidewalk the curb is uh, recessed to the street level like that's all we can improve we can't and we can't widen the sidewalk next certain, on someone else's property that we don't own. are you certain that that not not widening that is going to make pedestrian traffic there safer trying to cross Susquehanna? I would think fixing... <laughs> Building side, improving sidewalk along Susquehanna Road has nothing to do with crossing Susquehanna Road. I'm sorry, sir. I crossed that road and well, I know what it does. You asked... Yep. You asked about improving the sidewalk yep. along Susquehanna Road. Right. That is the proposal. Can it be widened? Can answer. it be widened? This is a minor question, but I think it's important. <coughs> the sidewalk can be widened on our portion of the property. It can't, it, we, we can't widen it next okay. to the cemetery. Okay, my next question is, how does someone living in a Abington Terrace walk from Abington Terrace to Susquehanna <coughs> and Old York Road without going on that sidewalk? I'm just going to object. That's just beyond the scope of our presentation. He's okay. asking well, about other pedestrian circulation question. throughout the township. All right, sir. Next question. It's his prerogative as the attorney to yeah, reject your question. Attorney? What's that? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm, I know it's not. I know it's not. But there's a lot of irrelevant things. So time is of the essence. Do you have legitimate questions yes, you want to ask? time is of the essence. And we asked to have this meeting after December 18th. Okay. All right, that should uh, cover everyone who had signed up for standing. <coughs> Ms. Lehman, I think your status was questioned by the attorney. And I would like to protest that officially, and I would like to leave you my statement. I don't have it right now on my chair. I want to leave you my statement to be part of the record. I have some of my comments are in there, and some of my, in fact, all, almost all of my questions are in there. You've all received it in your emails. I would like to make sure that that becomes part of the permanent record and that also part of the record is my protest that I was improperly denied status. One of the properties that they are negotiating with Ms. is Lehman. a property in four blocks of my Ms. home. Ms. Lehman, your status was questioned. That's the end of it. Thank you. And, and, Thank and not you. only that, that I believe this was not a time for statements. Right. to be added to the record okay. that is she is still able to do that mm -hmm. under the rules of this uh, hearing so we still have <coughs> we still have minutes to use up so at this point we'll open it up to residents who have comments name and address and now we can go with the three minute speaking <coughs> I was just going to say I'm going to pass <coughs> you now just give it to the manager Good evening. My name is Rebecca Fellerman. I live at 1074 Wynwood Road. I've lived in Abington since 2004, and I'm a licensed architect in Pennsylvania with extensive experience in sustainable design and historic preservation. Last week, I spoke at the Planning Commission against the BET proposal, and I emailed each of you a copy of my remarks. I hope you had a chance to read them. Abington Zoning Code <coughs> sets into law what our community values and desires for its built environment. The Abington community values neighborhoods, environment, pedestrian-friendly streetscapes, open space, appropriately scaled construction, excellent design, and respect for and preservation of our history. BET zoning proposal does not uphold Abington's values. It injects an urban scale design into a suburban setting a design which overwhelms the neighborhoods surrounding the site. It eliminates valuable open space 
is set too close to the street, negatively impacts the historic cemetery, and demolishes existing buildings of significant design and historic value to our community. <laughs> buildings that could be repurposed and adapted for use of BET's proposal. Even more disturbing, BET is seeking not a variance or waiver, but a change to Abington zoning code, opening the door for more projects that will negatively impact Abington. Further, as reported in the December 2nd Sunday Inquirer on the impact of this type of development in Chester County, BET's proposed change to our code will change this town forever, ushering in an era of overcrowded, high-rise luxury apartment towers, driving up the cost of living and housing in our community, and forcing long-term residents out of our community because they will no longer be able to live here. Regarding Mr. Kennedy's analysis and support of BET's project, yes, Abington needs senior housing. We need to accommodate an aging population. And yes, this site is in a mixed-use area of neighborhoods, medical office, retail, and churches, an area where over time the historic fabric in adjacent neighborhoods have been eroded by development. The fact that we have already lost most, much of our historic fabric and neighborhood structure does not mean we have to accept any more. New housing needs should not be provided by driving long-term residents away. Instead of continuing the status quo, we must insist that this project support and enhance our community's remaining neighborhood and historic structures, instead of continuing the trend of erosion and destruction. If our zoning code is to be changed, changes should be driven by what is appropriate for our community and not dictated by the profit margin of developers. developers. The community needs, community's needs must be the priority, not dollar size, signs, and the zoning code must uphold our values, improving our neighborhoods, encouraging pedestrian-friendly streetscapes, mandating historic preservation, and requiring open space. BET is turning its back on the context of Abington community and forcing our community to accept an urban scale solution. BET should be sent back to the drawing board to return with an appropriately scaled approach that recognizes and retains the existing fe unique features of this site and our community. I urge you to require BET to embrace and enhance our community instead of tearing it down. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Name and address, please. Heidi Kleiman, 1785 Brook Road. This will be brief. Um, when I read the most recent recommendation from the Montgomery County Planning Commission, personally, I, I read it with qualifications. In the recommendation, it said that it must be compatible with residential areas. It must be residentially scaled buildings next to residential areas that it emphasizes the importance of an adequate buffer. I don't feel like the current renderings do that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Name and address, please. Diane Marsh, 1779 Brook Road. Uh, these are questions to the commissioners and, and beyond. So how do the commissioners take into consideration the citizens' opinions when they're formu formulating how do you as commissioners? Well, we don't answer questions at the okay. podium. We so I'll, I'll make throw that just out. Com just comments. Thank okay. You. And and how are how are you attending to the triangle as as so well described by, by Van? That will be my question. I throw out to how are you looking at, at as a whole um, when you make a decision about a text amendment? Um, and then these are questions: Could we still move forward without a text amendment? Could this building could a building be built and move forward? without a text amendment, you know, a series of buildings. Can we maintain open space without buying and destroying a neighborhood home and move forward with a project? Could we keep the historic YMCA building and still move forward? Could we reduce the height and the visual of the, um, of the that was really well described here, of what we already have in our historic section of Old York Road? And has a study been done on the impact of building such um, such a large-scale uh, plan um, to a fragile historic cemetery next door that already has uh, some crumbling, um, you know, headstones? Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment?
Good evening. Elizabeth Smith, 1078 Wellington Road. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Abington Township and would like to uh, voice my support for the project tonight, both from my professional background as well as from my personal experiences. So professionally, I have a background in traffic engineering, um, both undergraduate and graduate degrees, and I'm a licensed professional engineer. Um, I think that density is very often seen as a four-letter word in many of our suburban communities. Um, currently, I work as a planner for SEPTA, and this is something that we come up against quite commonly when trying to advocate for denser developments near transit, which I would qualify this as. When density is done correctly, it is not a four-letter word. From what I have read in the traffic impact study, this development will actually generate less peak hour trips, which is certainly a benefit. And then having the proximity to both the Route 55 bus as well as Noble Station will help to ensure that as time moves on in the future, not every trip being generated by this development will be uh, generated by single uh, vehicle occupants. Um, additionally, looking through the fiscal impact analysis, which you've again uh, seen tonight, seems clear that this development has a very clear tax benefit uh, for Abington Township, which is something that we should all be thinking about, and especially in light of the trends that we're seeing nationally uh, with what's going on with malls across the country, King of Prussia being the exception. From a personal standpoint, I have two parents that live in the township about a block from here. Uh, they're both retired. They no longer want the burden of maintaining their property, but frankly, they have nowhere to go. They want to stay in the township with their children and their grandchildren, but they feel trapped in their homes. They don't want to move to Upper Dublin. They don't want to leave Abington. They want to be here with us. They want to spend their dollars in the township. They want to volunteer in the township and they want to uh, basically use our entertainment in the township. And by doing that, they are just stuck in their homes. So from personal experience, my family is actually living this issue that you see today. So whether this text amendment goes through or whether this development goes through, I do urge you to consider from a broader standpoint how we can accommodate aging in place in the township because it certainly is having an impact on a lot of families that live in Abington today. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Any other comments from the public? This gentleman in the back. Hmm. I thought we were going to stop at 11. Uh, Mark Pazaka, 103 Edge Hill Road. This is My comments nice will be very brief because I, nice one. I uh, totally agree with that young lady. Just wanted to speak my uh, voice for the project. I grew up in Cheltenham Township. I watched for years and years and heard stories of years before how they fought development and stuff in Cheltenham, and now they have a crumbling infrastructure and their schools are falling <laughs> apart. And, the, and they'll you know, they're, they're in trouble for not supporting projects like this in the past. Here in Abington, we're lucky because despite all the citizens that protested it in the late 70s and early 80s, we were able to build the Willow Grove Mall. And uh, that Willow Grove Mall has been generating tax dollars and carrying this township for a very long time. It's my fear if we chase developers that are willing to work with us and compromise and and listen to all the, the people of the community. If we chase them out of this township, they'll move along to other townships. Um, you know, Upper Dublin is desperate. The, t the taxes in Upper Dublin are twice what the taxes are on my house right now. They're desperate for any kind of commercial uh, investment in their, in, their, in their place, and I don't ever want to see Abington get desperate. So I think we have to keep with the trends and support developers that want to work with us and build a good community for us that helps relieve some of the tax burden from the citizens. Thank you for Thanks. your comments. All right. Okay. At this time, it's 11 p.m. Excuse me, sir. Okay. We're just going to recess to a date to be determined. Thank you.